안녕하십니까 대한한인사협회 부회장 송미덕 최문석입니다 지금부터 K-Medicine 2020 인터내셔널 온라인 컨퍼런스를 시작하겠습니다 먼저 대한한의사협회 최혜경 회장의 인사 말씀이 있겠습니다. 안녕하십니까. 대한한의사협회 회장 최혜경입니다. 코로나19 팬데믹으로 기존의 질서가 무너지고 뉴노멀의 시대가 도래했습니다. 예년 같으면 한자리에 모여서 서로 안부도 묻고 학술 연구 공유도 하고 그랬을 텐데 이 온라인으로 대체할 수밖에 없는 현실이 좀 안타깝기는 합니다. 그래도 한편으로는 이렇게라도 여러분과 함께 할수 있어서 또 감사하기도 합니다. 모두가 힘든 시기임에도 불구하고 포스트 코로나 시대 통합 의료로 나아갈 방향을 찾다 를 주제로 강연을 맞아주신 발표자 여러분께도 깊은 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 우리 대한한의사협회는 지난 1월 국내 첫 확진자가 발생함과 동시에 코로나19의 위협으로부터 국민의 생명을 지키고자 노력해왔습니다. 한의사 회원들의 자발적인 참여와 지원 아래 지난 3월부터 시작된 비대면 전화진료상담센터 불과 두어 달 만에 대한민국 확진자들의 20% 이상이 이용했을 정도로 많은 사랑을 받았습니다. 특히 대구 경북 지역에서 발생했던 그 1차 팬데믹 병상이 모자라서 한때 자가격리자만 2천 명이 넘어갔죠. 그런 분들이 우리 한의진료센터의 전화진료를 통해서 정서적인 지지도 받고 위중한 케이스도 판별하고 한약치료까지 받을 수 있었습니다. 우리 협회는 이렇게 축적된 소중한 진료 경험을 토대로 포스트 코로나19 시대를 준비하고 통합 의료에 나아갈 방향을 모색하고 있습니다. 이러한 점에서 세계 전통의학 전문가 여러분과 함께하는 이 컨퍼런스가 코로나19 극복을 앞당기고 코로나 이후의 세대에 전통의학을 활용한 보건의료의 미래 비전을 공유하는 그런 뜻깊은 자리가 될 것임을 믿어 의심치 않습니다. 이 모쪼록 오늘 발표될 내용들이 세계인의 건강과 생명을 지키는 소중한 밑거름이 되기를 진심으로 기대하며 코로나19가 종식되고 만날 수 있는 그날까지 항상 건강과 행운이 가득하시기를 기원합니다. 감사합니다. 다음으로 대한민국 국회 보건복지위원회 김민석 위원장의 축사가 있겠습니다. 이어서 보건복지부 강도태 차관의 축사 말씀을 듣겠습니다. 안녕하십니까? 국회 보건복지위원장 김민석 의원입니다. 오늘 행사명이 k m e d i c i n 2020이고 또 주제가 포스트 코로나 시대 통합 의료로 나아갈 방향을 찾다 이렇게 되어 있는 것을 보면서 포스트 코로나 통합 의료 k m e d i c i n 을 이렇게 하나의 연장선상에서 아, 사고한다는 것이 무슨 뜻일까 이렇게 생각을 해봤습니다. 결국 코로나 이후에 우리에게 요구되고 있는 새로운 접근, 새로운 패러다임, 새로운 문명적 관점이 통합의료의 길을 요구하고 있는 것이고 그것을 잘 찾아내는 데 k m e d i 의 길이 있는 것이 아닌가라는 어떤 어, 제 나름의 생각을 해보게 되었습니다. 얼마 전에 국회 보건복지위원회에서의 여론조사를 하면서 통합의료에 대한 국민들의 의견을 여쭤보기도 했습니다. 긍정적인 목소리가 다소 높으면서도 상당히 토론할 대목이 많다 하는 그런 결과를 보고 많은 생각을 하게 되었고 이것을 앞으로 진지하게 우리가 논의할 과제다 이런 생각을 하게 됐는데 오늘 컨퍼런스를 통해서 우리가 국제적으로도 이런 토론을 하는 좋은 계기가 되길 바라고요. 그 내용을 저희도 잘 받아 안아서 앞으로 저희가 국회에서 입법 활동을 해 나가는 데 있어서 또 국제적으로도 이런 논의가 확산되는 데 있어서 좋은 계기가 되었으면 하는 마음입니다. 다시 한번 오늘 참석해 주신 모든 분들께 감사드립니다. 감사합니다. 안녕하십니까. 보건복지부 이창한 강도태입니다. 오늘 온라인으로 개최되는 k m e d i c i n 2020 국제 전통의학 컨퍼런스를 진심으로 축하합니다. 또한 컨퍼런스에 주제 발표를 해주실 발표자와 온라인을 통해 참석하신 모든 분께 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 코로나19가 전 세계적으로 대유행하고 있습니다. 
이에 보건의료인들과 보건정책 담당자들이 코로나19 확산 방지와 환자 치료 등을 위해 헌신하고 있습니다. 이 자리를 빌려 세계 보건의료인들의 헌신에 깊이 감사드립니다. 우리나라도 코로나19를 극복하기 위해 국가적 노력을 기울이고 있습니다. 정부는 드라이브 스루 방식의 선별진료소와 생활치료센터 등을 활용한 코로나19 방역체계를 운영하고 있습니다. 또한 모든 국민이 자발적으로 마스크 착용, 사회적 거리 두기 등 방역수칙을 준수해 주고 있습니다. 이를 통해 K-방역으로 알려진 성과를 낼수 있었습니다. 코로나19 대유행을 극복하기 위해서는 방역활동과 백신 치료제 보급이 중요합니다. 또한 오랜 임상 경험이 있는 전통의학의 역할도 중요하다고 생각합니다. 예를 들어 전통의학은 격리된 경증 환자의 건강관리와 면역정직을 통한 조기회복 등에서 제 역할을 할수 있다고 봅니다. 우리나라도 코로나19로 격리된 경증 환자 중 일부를 대상으로 한의사들이 비대면 전화 상담 등을 통해 한의학 서비스를 제공한 바 있습니다. 오늘 개최되는 전통의학 국제 컨퍼런스는 코로나19 대응에 전통의학을 활용한 경험을 함께 공유하는 뜻깊은 자리입니다. 아울러 코로나 극복 이후에 의료통합이라는 미래 보건의료 비전까지 논의하게 됩니다. 저는 오늘 개최되는 국제 컨퍼런스가 코로나19 극복과 전통의학 발전을 위한 중요한 자리가 되기를 기대합니다. 마지막으로 컨퍼런스를 준비해 주신 대한한의사협회 회장님과 관계자분들께 감사드립니다. 그리고 오늘 발표를 맡아주신 분들과 온라인으로 참여하고 있는 세계 각국의 모든 분의 가정에 건강과 행복이 함께하기를 기원하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 축사 감사합니다. 이어서 컨퍼런스를 시작하겠습니다. 오늘 저희 둘이 사회와 좌장 역할을 하겠습니다. 최문석 박사님은 현재 대한한의사협회 부회장이십니다. 이번 COVID-19 TF의 위원장으로서 한의계의 초기 대응부터 전화진료단 등 시행을 주관하고 계십니다. 현재 식품의약품안전처 중앙약사심의 전문가 위원이시기도 합니다. 오늘 잘 부탁드립니다. 송미덕 박사님도 역시 현재 대한한의사협회 부회장이십니다. 이번 COVID-19 TF의 전화진료단 진료 설계와 진료 자문단을 운영하셨습니다. 개인 클리닉을 25년간 임상을 하고 있고 한의사들의 평생교육 컨티닝 프로페셔널 디벨롭먼트 프로그램에 관여하고 있습니다. 잘 부탁드립니다. 네. 2020년은 코로나 바이러스로 인해 모든 활동이 이축되었습니다. 국제학술대회도 이런 온라인 형식을 취하게 되었습니다. 이 컨퍼런스는 2020년 한국의 한의학 온라인 홍보관 오픈을 기념하여 기획되었습니다. 특히 올해에는 대유행되고 있는 COVID-19에 세계적으로 의료인의 역할이 더욱 드러나게 되었죠. 이러한 감염병 상황에 전통의학이 어떻게 대응했는지 각국의 의료 현장에서 확인되고 경험한 내용을 다루어 보려고 합니다. 세션 1은 한국 세션입니다. 대한한의사협회는 2019년 12월 중국에서 발생한 코로나 바이러스 원인으로 추정되는 사망 사례를 접한 후 TF를 결성하고 향후 한국에서 유행될 시 한의사의 역할에 대하여 논의를 해왔습니다. 중국에서 발표되는 진료 가이드를 업데이트를 지속하여 모니터링 해왔고 3월 초에 대구에서 집단 감염 사례 이후 폭발적으로 늘어나는 환자들을 대상으로 
전화진료센터를 가동했습니다. 한국은 세계적으로 방역이 매우 잘 이루어지고 있는 국가이지만 아직까지도 수차 웨이브를 겪으면서 환자 수가 늘고 있습니다. 물론 치료율도 높고 사망률은 낮고 질병의 특성상 격리가 우선이지만 경증의 환자 또한 많은 것도 사실입니다. 한국의 발표는 이러한 한의계의 준비 과정, 환자들에 대한 인구 사회학적 연구, 치료 효과들을 다루게 됩니다. 첫 번째 연자는 우석대학교 한의과대학 장인수 교수입니다. 동대학의 학장과 병원장을 영임했었고 무엇보다도 논문을 많이 쓰시는 분입니다. 순환기계, 신경과를 담당하시고 포토메디신 앤 레이저 서저리 저널의 편집위원이십니다. 이번 한국의 전화진료단이 사용한 진료 권고안을 만드는 데큰 기여를 하셨습니다. 발표의 제목은 Clinical Guidance on COVID-19 in Korean Medicine and the Role of the Telemedicine Center입니다. 헬로, 마이 네임 이즈 인수 장 and I am a professor affiliated with Usok University. My talk will be on the clinical practice guidelines uh, on COVID-19 in Korean medicine and the role of the telemedicine center. I was the chair of uh, the CPG uh, development committee on the Korean medicine treatment for COVID-19. And I also was on the advisory board for the telemedicine center of Korean medicine for COVID-19. In March, uh, at the TCI online seminar, which is under the WHO, the World Health Organization, I conducted a talk on uh, Korean medicine use, and uh, there were 10 uh, different talks, and I mainly talked about uh, the role of Korean medicine for COVID-19 in Korea. I also submitted a letter uh, titled How Telemedicine Can Ease Hospital Workloads Amid COVID-19 uh, for newspaper coverage uh, in the South China Mo Morning Post, which is uh, published in Hong Kong. I will review the current state of uh, COVID-19 uh, currently globally, and as of uh, 27th of November, uh, there are currently uh, 61 million uh, confirmed cases, and there are over uh, 1.4 million deaths. And by very crude uh, estimates, uh, it is estimated that we will reach uh, 100 uh, confirmed, 100 million confirmed cases uh, in about uh, three months. And in that case, COVID-19 would become uh, the COVID, uh, would become the pandemic that ranks third in uh, total uh, confirmed cases and deaths. The first would be the uh, pest of medieval times, and the second would be the Spanish flu of 1919, and the third would be COVID-19. The fatality rate is currently estimated at 2.35 percent worldwide. The three uh, highest ranking countries are the U US, India and Brazil, and uh, these three countries uh, take up 40% uh, of all cases. And it can be considered a uh, considerably high spread and a uh, tragedy for the whole world. Next, uh, the other uh, country rankings are listed, and you can see in Mexico the fatality rate is high at almost 10%, and so there is uh, quite a great discrepancy regarding the fatality rate uh, between nations uh, from about 1% to almost 10%. Low fertility rates are shown in Austria, Japan, and Taiwan, and uh, South Korea is currently ranked at uh, 93. However, currently we are facing the third resurgence, and so uh, constant vigilance is uh, required of all of us. So the current state of, for Korea overall uh, has been uh, addressed, and regarding the regions, uh, currently the Seoul uh, capital region and also the Gyeonggi Jiok and the Incheon Jiok uh, show highest occurrence. In March, when we had the f uh, first occurrence, mass occurrence and outbreak of uh, COVID-19, the Daegu and the Gyeongbu region was where we had uh, the highest number of occurrences and confirmed cases. However, presently, uh, the Seoul and the Gyeongin uh, region is where we show uh, the highest uh, increase in number of patients and the spread is also fastest. These contents were also uh, introduced in my talk in the WHO uh, talk, and uh, Korea was very swift in its response and also in uh, acquiring uh, test kits. And so large-scale diagnostic tests uh, were conducted every day with uh, 20,000 cases, tests uh, 
conducted every day. And also regarding disclosure of uh, movements of the patients, uh, they are identified immediately using smartphone uh, location services and also credit card use monitoring. And we have transparent uh, in information disclosure and uh, also utilization of various innovative technology such as drive through tests. And we are also uh, spreading them uh, overseas uh, for uh, global use. And Korea also acted faster uh, than any other country regarding the classification of uh, patients according to their severity. And so patients who were asymptomatic or mild were uh, secluded in life care facilities, and those who were moderate and severe and required immediate uh, medical attention were allocated to hospitals and ICUs. So the dispersion of uh, patients uh, was received uh, global attention uh, regarding its uh, effectiveness, and uh, we still are uh, considered to stay safe, uh, relatively safe, uh, stable, and uh, have orderly control. Last July, uh, we had an online conference uh, between the Society of Korean Medicine and the Chinese Medical Academic uh, Society. And here, Tong Xiaoling, who is known as uh, one of uh, the leading experts in a traditional Chinese medicine regarding COVID-19, gave a lecture. In China, COVID-19 is considered to be a uh, Hansi uh, which is a cold and dampness uh, pandemic. And so it uh, diverges slightly from previous uh, warm infectious diseases. This is a map uh, showing Wuhan of uh, China, and you can see it is uh, somewhat similar to Florida. There are a lot of uh, water regions, uh, swamps, lakes, and the relative humidity uh, is always over 80% uh, all year round. And so uh, this gives rise to the reason why uh, a pandemic such as COVID-19 uh, occurred with a cold uh, dampness um, pandemic. In Korea, starting in February and March of this year, uh, we uh, provided telemedicine uh, services uh, for Korea medicine and COVID-19 using non-face-to-face -face, uh, consultations. And the strengths and limitations, pros and cons of this, these services are very uh, distinct. Regarding the cons and limitations, uh, the largest limitation is that we only uh, provided care for mild cases and also uh, the herbal medicine prescriptions were limited. Also, uh, treatment was limited to non-face-to-face -face care and the government cooperation and support was limited and restricted. The pros and strengths of uh, Korean medicine use in COVID-19 uh, was evidenced in the March WHO conference where uh, China and uh, Korea were the only countries that were able to provide uh, uh, traditional uh, medicine treatment to early confirmed cases and also uh, Korean medicine showed a very rapid response to treatment. And uh, through this, we were able to provide a Korean medicine treatment to about 20% of all confirmed cases in Korea. And also the reports of uh, Korean cases uh, based on theory and the case reports uh, data are being accumulated uh, to be published in various research outlets. And therefore, they show uh, the potential for use of Korean medicine in uh, COVID-19 and other pandemics. Next, I will give an introduction of the CPG uh, for Korea medicine for uh, COVID-19 use. Although in English we use the term uh, CPG uh, to refer to these kind of guidelines, uh, this does not apply to infectious diseases as there is not enough uh, time to develop them according to the normal format and we have to uh, be dependent on ex expert opinion. As they cannot be uh, developed according to the regular format, uh, we have to use mainly expert consensus and so in English uh, the term guidance is more appropriate. The Korea medicine version also uses the term Korea medicine recommendations instead of uh, CPG and this is for uh, similar reasons. The first uh, Korean medicine, Korean edition, was uh, prepared in March and the indications uh, for Korea medicine treatment in COVID-19 were limited to mild and uh, patients, mild patients and patients in the recovery stage. Although this could be uh, viewed as a limitation, it also reflects uh, the situation in Korea and in moderate and severe stage patients, conventional Western medication and interventions were used at the as the main modality and uh, herbal medicines and uh, Korean medicine was used uh, in conjunction. 
As Korean medicine's approach uh, to COVID-19 uh, confirmed cases was limited, uh, this was why a treatment was mainly uh, limited to the mild and recovery stage patients. Their overall order of contents are as follows. The image that you see here is the algorithm flowchart in the Korea Medicine Guide for Coronavirus. When a patient confirmed as COVID-19 comes in, the algorithm is divided within the flowchart based on diagnosis of pneumonia. Division is also dependent on respiratory symptoms and general symptoms. On the far left, we have a symptomatic patients, and next, early mild stage, mid mild stage, moderate and severe stage, and we have, lastly, the critical stage with critically ill patients. A simplified flowchart is shown on the screen here. When COVID-19 patients first come in after confirmation, they are divided according to diagnosis of pneumonia. Further, based on whether they have fever or not, they are classified as heat syndrome. Various non-respiratory symptoms are also accompanied in many COVID-19 patients. The most frequently seen symptoms are diarrhea and severe fatigue. These patients are classified as dampness syndrome. These contents are reflected in this table. The classifications and prescription recommendations are connected with the relevant symptoms. The general prescription is shown on the far right and is tongpebedoktang and can be used in all stages. In the early mild stage, patients are divided into external heat syndrome according to fever and dampness syndrome according to diarrhea symptoms. And in the mid mild stage, it is divided into internal heat syndrome and severe dampness syndrome. And then treatment is divided into the moderate and severe stage and critical stage. In English, this shows the overall uh, table. In the early mild stage, we have a, a external heat syndrome, and here the main symptoms are fever. And for prescriptions, we use Hyungbang Kwedoksan and Gumi Kaantang. In dampness syndrome, with complaints of diarrhea and loose stool, Kwakyang Jonggisan and Kwakban Haryongtang are uh, prescribed. In the mid mild stage, uh, we have internal heat syndrome where the heat heat symptoms become more aggravated, and we also have the severe dampness syndrome. Prescriptions are used according to the pattern differentiation patterns differently. Various prescriptions are given, including Mayan Kamsoktang, variations, and Ungyosan. In the moderate and severe stage, similarly Mayan Kamsoktang variations are used according to stage. The reason why we propose Tongpe Bedoktang as a general prescription is that although herbal medications indicated for antiviral diseases and influenza were already presented and these various prescriptions are included in the Korean Medicine Guide for Coronavirus Disease. However, there are no prescriptions that have been confirmed to be corona-specific. At this time, the only prescription was that from China that was investigated and confirmed to have effect in coronavirus patients. Data was collected from patients and so we used Tongpe Bedoktang as the basic prescription. Also, one of the main characteristics for Korea medicine use uh, was that it was conducted non-face-to-face. -face. The reason for this was that face-to-face -face, consultation was not available, is the only reason for this. Because uh, the patients were under a self-quarantine or self-isolation state, uh, there was no choice, uh, as uh, no contact between the patient and physician was possible. And regarding this, uh, pros include the fact that it was safe for both, both ends, both the patients and for the physician, and also uh, self-vital checks and various uh, self-reported data was collected by uh, various methods in, uh, in an attempt uh, to collect data exchange, including body temperature, respiratory rate, and uh, heart pulse. The fact that information was exchanged and questions and answers were given uh, in non-face-to-face -face format uh, were some of the strengths of uh, this format. And uh, the cons and limitations include the fact that it was difficult to diagnose. Diagnose was uh, highly limited and also it would take more time and uh, the inaccuracy was higher. Despite uh, these limitations, uh, the indicated uh, patients were in the mild and recovery stage and uh, some characteristics including the fact that uh, the treatment was free and complementary and all expenses were covered by donations can be uh, considered to be some uh, major strengths. 
and career medicine was thus conducted without a further burden on the patients. As shown on the screen, various centers were established and operated. Self-check of respiratory rate and heart rates uh, was also uh, optimized and we also made use of EMR records and uh, various smartphone applications and Kakao Talk and Face Talk, which are widely used in uh, Korea, were also some main uh, communication uh, tools and some strengths of our telemedicine center operation. Uh, this is an analysis uh, made on uh, July uh, 10th regarding the results of our telemedicine uh, center operation. And uh, we saw that 21%, over 21% of all COVID-19 patients in Korea had received our telemedicine services. This was a first effort and a trial for us in this type of consultation operation. And we believe that it holds a great implications for primary health care. The reason for this uh, is from two different perspectives. The first is regarding uh, whether we would uh, we would prefer to use single use uh, level D personal protective equipment, including goggles and the gowns, and still be exposed to uh, various risks, or use a telemedicine in non face to face uh, consultation and treatment within possible boundaries. And so within primary health care, uh, regarding which option is uh, more appropriate is uh, something that we should consider. I will briefly cover uh, primary health care providers in Korea. Regarding the average rate of primary care physicians, uh, according to the OECD, uh, the average is 28.9%. And in Korea, including Korea medicine doctors, it's uh, estimated at 27%. And so a little under 30% of uh, physicians are uh, designated as primary care physicians. However, 80% of COVID-19 patients are mild stage patients and the, also the pandemic is currently underway and ongoing. And so the government needs to uh, think of how to utilize uh, their resources of uh, primary care physicians, uh, including Korea medicine doctors uh, better in response. And we believe that uh, this will provide a better solution to COVID-19. As a last message, I will sum up uh, my lecture. We are still currently evolving and uh, underway. And the third wave of COVID-19 is uh, currently occurring uh, within Korea. And uh, we are currently uh, unsure as to how the situation will uh, evolve from here. However, uh, the Korea medicine doctors, uh, the services they provided in non-face-to-face -face services, although uh, it might be the second best, it could be a different alternative solution. Although it might not be the best, still as the second best, it still holds uh, great uh, implications and potential. As in, in acute infectious uh, disasters and pandemics, it may be the last option and most optimal in primary care. And policy providers and the government should be very mindful of uh, these facts. How primary care physicians are utilized uh, should be uh, given further consideration and review. Thank you. 예, 두 번째 연장은 한의학 정책 연구원 이은경 원장입니다. 한의학 정책 연구원은 한의계 정책 관련 조사와 연구를 수행하는 기관입니다. 이번 전화 진료단이 수행한 진료 관련 내용을 인구 사회학적 관점으로 첫 논문을 냈고 진료 어, 전화 진료단 임상 데이터를 총괄하고 있습니다. 발표 제목은 텔레메디슨의 The Use of Korean Medicine with COVID-19 patients in South Korea. Hello, my name is Ingyung Lee and I am the director of the Research Institute of Korea Medicine Policy. Today I will be talking about the current status and results of telemedicine and the use of Korean medicine with COVID-19 patients in South Korea, which was conducted by the Association of Korean Medicine as the main agent. Various research papers and publications have been uh, publicated on the use of Korean medicine for COVID-19 patients and the center, and two papers have been published specifically regarding this center. One has been uh, published in IMR and one has been submitted and is currently under minor revision. Also, uh, one white paper has been published and my uh, presentation today will focus on these three publications. First, regarding the center's background. Please understand the images and materials and uh, newspaper articles in Korean were not translated into English. 
Since February, there was a mass outbreak that occurred in Tegu, and the number of uh, patients was too large for them to be accommodated in uh, all of the hospital facilities, as evidenced in this uh, newspaper article. And most of these pa uh, patients were mild uh, patients. So with the association taking the lead, a task force team was uh, formed and uh, various proposals for use of uh, for more use of KMDs and Korean medicine use for COVID-19 were proposed. As uh, Professor In Su Tang uh, mentioned earlier in his talk, the Korean medicine uh, clinical practice guidelines were published for use of Korean medicine in COVID-19 and also a telemedicine center of Korean medicine for treating patients with COVID-19 was established in the Daegu region. Uh, this was in uh, the 31st of March and uh, in March, uh, April to May, there was an increase of COVID-19 patients. So this graph shows an increase of daily and uh, accumulated total number of patients in Korea. March 9th was when uh, the Daegu Telemedicine Center was established and this was when uh, the explosive increase was uh, marked in Daegu. Also March 31st is when we opened the Seoul Center and this also coincides with the surge of patients in Seoul. This graph shows uh, the general timeline of the occurrence of COVID-19 patients uh, with um, various major events marked below. So this shows a daily increase in newly diagnosed and um, accumulative a total number of patients. And especially in the Daegu and the Gyeongbuk region, there was a lack uh, in medical care uh, provided. A serious gap in the need and provision regarding medical care occurred. And as most of the patients were malpatients and government guidelines uh, were publicated regarding how these patients' symptoms could be managed non-face-to-face. -face. And so we established the Daegu and Gyeongbuk Region Center. And also following, uh, there was a nationwide expansion to reach the Seoul region uh, with the Seoul Center. So regarding the uh, procedure of treatment, uh, we used a various uh, publicity means and so the patient would call in and in the pre-examination we would check regarding the infection route, quarantine state, uh, which was assessed through preliminary uh, consultation. And as all of the patients were either in self-isolation or self-quarantine, we checked whether they were in the suspected stage or they had been confirmed with COVID-19. And also, as in Korea, uh, even if they had been confirmed to be negative of uh, symptoms after testing, uh, still in Korea, we, they were required to uh, undergo a two-week uh, self-isolation, uh, self-quarantine. Uh, so also regarding whether they were in the recovery stage was determined. As treatments were not conducted in person, consultations and uh, herbal medicine were the main modes of treatment. And although a protocol was guided with a consultation with experts, we also had daily consultations with various exper experts regarding how to conduct treatments. Mental health aspects, uh, including depression, uh, COVID-19 blues, and also uh, depression from isolation were also targets for treatment and a manual was pr prepared. Songpei Beduktang uh, was one of the main uh, treatments of herbal medicine used as it was a general prescription. And also Ungyosan, which is known for its uh, antiviral activities, and Kwakyang Jonggisan were also used. General career services uh, were not provided um, in Daegu at the time, and so uh, the herbal medicine was needed to be delivered directly uh, to the patient's res residence uh, by uh, volunteers. Follow calls were made to patients every three days to check for changes in symptoms, especially in more severe patients, and so uh, three days were the standards uh, for checking. As explained earlier, in suspected patients, uh, generally uh, herbal medicines known for their antiviral properties were used, such as Ngyosang, Bojung uh, Gitang, and Burangum Jonggisan. In confirmed patients, Chongpei Beduktang, which was the generalized prescription, was used, and also Ngyosan, which has uh, antiviral uh, properties and also is known to reduce uh, symptoms effectively. And in the recovery phase, Ikki uh, Bopetang, Gyeonggu, Mokyang, Jonggisan, and Sangwatang were used. 
For rhinorrhea, uh, we used uh, so chongyong tang, and for diarrhea, we, we would use uh, kwakyong jongisan. For depressive symptoms, we used uh, kami kibitang, and in cases of loss of smell and taste, we also used uh, hyangnang. The graph shown here uh, shows the various uh, herbal medicines that were used and a wide variety of herbal medicines were used, such as decoctions uh, in liquid form and also various uh, herbal extracts. And also hyangnang and uh, meditation uh, formats were also used. This picture shows Tongpe uh, Beduktang, which was in decoction form for easy storage and also for easy intake. Tongpe Beduktang is the general prescription that we use for COVID-19 and this shows uh, the raw herbal medicines that are included. As we could not observe uh, the results of treatment and the patients directly, uh, the review uh, by the Medical Advisory Committee was very important. It was co consisted of uh, professors of uh, Korean medicine respiratory diseases and various experts of cl uh, wide clinical uh, experience. The committee uh, convened daily and checked whether the prescriptions were appropriate, uh, whether there were no uh, risk factors, uh, signs for uh, additional follow-ups or referrals to other medical institutions. Next, I will introduce the main results of uh, the center treatments, most of which have been publicized in various research papers. The largest limitation of our center's treatment was that it was conducted non-face-to-face -face, and so we could not access uh, clinical medical records. So the limitation is that uh, the information that we collected was indirect. So uh, they were reports from the patient regarding what kind of testing they had received, or what opinions they had received from uh, medical doctors. And uh, about 80% of uh, the, the patients that we saw, that we treated, were in the recovery phase. So although most of the patients that we saw were not in the active viral phase and uh, were either in the mild uh, stage or in the recovery phase, and uh, so a limitation of our treatments was that uh, we did not uh, treat acute uh, patients in the active phase. Still, uh, while uh, we treated about 80% of uh, mild or uh, asymptomatic patients, still uh, our treatment holds significance in that uh, we were able to provide a lot of treatment uh, in regarding the treatment gap. And also Korean medicine doctors and Korean uh, medical college students uh, provided their services uh, spontaneously in volunteer work and this is also of significance and in the Daegu center uh, it daily 13 to 15 uh, Korean medicine doctors and uh, college students uh, provided services and in the Seoul center 14 to 26 uh, provided services every day the red graph shows the number of confirmed accumulated COVID-19 patients and the blue graph shows the number of patients that were treated uh, by the Korea Medicine Tel Telemedicine Center. And although the number goes a little down at the end, uh, when you see uh, June 30th, 20.3% of all confirmed cases were treated at Korea Medicine Centers. Regarding the demographic characteristics of uh, patients that enrolled in the Korea Medicine Tele Telemedicine program, uh, the most patients conducted four to five uh, sessions uh, of number of calls and regarding the residence of patients, most were in uh, self-isolation or self-quarantine. This slide uh, shows the proportion of uh, patients uh, regarding sex who used uh, the Korea Medicine Telemedicine Center and the proportion of female patients were eight, was 18% point higher than uh, confirmed positive COVID-19 patients in South Korea. Uh, this seems to be attributed to uh, women's preferences regarding uh, healthcare services and Korean medicine uh, preference. This is also similar regarding age. Uh, in comparison of uh, the patients who use Korean medicine, telemedicine, and uh, the total number of patients in uh, Korea, the proportion of patients in their 20s and 30s was lower, and the proportion of patients in their 40s and 50s was high. And while after the Tegu Center we opened the center in Seoul, uh, still uh, the number of patients who used the Seoul Center were mainly uh, based in Tegu and the Gyeongbuk region. And this shows that uh, the male patients in Tegu and Gyeongbuk were not able to receive uh, the proper 
uh, medicine that uh, they they wish to receive, and so the Seoul Center was able to take care of this lack and shortage of uh, medical care and attention. Regarding COVID-19 symptom changes uh, before and after Korean medicine tele telemedicine treatment, uh, headaches, uh, muscle pains, and uh, fevers were checked every three days, and uh, the values were uh, checked for statistical uh, uh, significance uh, and analyzed. The results uh, show significant decrease and uh, the values are significant. However, the response rate uh, due to this uh, being conducted by telephone and telemedicine uh, goes down. And so although these uh, rates are not uh, very accurate, uh, still they show that um, the small symptoms uh, were well managed through Korea medicine. This table shows the analysis regarding uh, underlying diseases such as for uh, diabetes mellitus and also uh, risk factors such as uh, high age. And in preparation for research papers, uh, these underlying diseases are being analyzed separately. The reason for checking these underlying diseases was uh, because one of our main concerns that was that uh, because the consultations were conducted non-face-to-face, -face, uh, we could not check for aggravation of symptoms directly. And so uh, this additional analysis of uh, underlying diseases was conducted as part of efforts to take care of uh, potential uh, aggravation in COVID-19 patients. However, the number of patients with underlying diseases uh, is not high. The prevalence uh, was from about uh, 10 to 15 percent. And in comparison re regarding underlying diseases of our group who received Korean medicine and the group that did not, there is not a such significant difference. The satisfaction rates were generally high. Uh, however, the satisfaction rates for treatment and the use of, uh, for terms of treatment and the use of telephone use uh, was uh, somewhat uh, lower. However, the willingness to recommend uh, this to others and the willingness to use Korean medicine treatment was high. Next is a slide uh, describing the prescriptions used uh, that I explained uh, earlier briefly. Chongpe uh, Bedoktang is the generalized prescription uh, that was developed in China. However, it includes mahuang, and uh, because of uh, potential adverse effects, uh, we divided it, them into Chongpe uh, Bedoktang into decoctions uh, types one and two. So Chongpe Bedoktang uh, type one, uh, which includes mahuang, was the most frequently used uh, prescription. And also, patients in the recovery phase used ikipopetang and other such prescriptions. Regarding the region of the patients who received uh, telemedicine, Korean medicine, the duration after the first call was uh, generally the term was uh, 15 days. And so uh, there were various changes uh, over the course of this duration. And so confirmed patients, uh, some of them would be released from isolation after uh, being uh, declared negative. Uh, some would be um, changed and transferred to centers uh, and institutions and so there was a wide variety of changes and it was hard to follow up their uh, current regional status. Most of the patients that we treated were confirmed cases. However, uh, they were declared negative afterwards and were released and they returned home. Uh, this percentage was uh, highest at 59% and also the next highest frequency was those in the isolation phase of uh, 25%. So these patients showed highest frequency uh, at 59% and 25%. Whether the patients were uh, staying at home in home self-isolation or in facility isolation was also an important factor in analysis of epidemiological factors. The reason why I mentioned this is because uh, of the patients that were treated at the center, most were released afterwards at 25%. And patients within uh, self-isolation or the self-quarantine uh, phase uh, showed a much longer duration of treatment and uh, these patients were the patients that were the focus of our analysis. The average number of treatments for patients who were released uh, from quarantine was about uh, seven sessions, which was uh, higher than the four sessions for other patients. And uh, this shows that uh, those patients within the self-isolation uh, or the quarantine phase uh, were patients that were in need of medical care and attention. Also regarding the treatment period, uh, the patients that uh, received treatment at our center and then were released from isolation received a treatment 
uh, for 25 days, which was longer than the average 15 days of other patients and shows that they were in more severe state. One of the important things uh, that we checked was uh, whether the patient had red flag signs. So one of um, the important roles of our center was to decide whether this patient uh, was able to receive, uh, continue to receive uh, telemedicine treatment in self-isolation or whether they would need to be uh, referred to a higher medical hospital or the emergency room. Up till now was the report of the results of a treatment at the Korea Medicine Center. At the association, the telemedicine center is still under operation and we are still uh, collecting data regarding these uh, patients who uh, continue to call us. The data is being analyzed to be submitted in the form of research papers and white papers uh, for promotion uh, regarding the use of uh, Korean medicine in COVID-19. And so uh, I hope that uh, you may uh, use uh, these various research papers as a uh, further reference. Lastly, I would like to talk about uh, our Korean Medicine Center's uh, uh, reasons for success. Although the strengths and limitations are very um, obvious, regarding the reasons for its success, um, one of the reasons uh, was that the patients contact contacted us directly. Uh, its background was due to the publicity materials uh, that we uh, used for promotion, and about 20% uh, of our patients contacted us directly because of that. This is significant because the government, although we uh, applied and asked uh, several times, did not uh, help us regarding publicity. And so uh, these uh, uh, results were achieved without the help of the government. And the executives of the association employees uh, were first in offering their services in volunteer work. It started with the Tegu Center. And this shows a Korean medicine doctor who participated uh, in the Daegu Center uh, as the courier services and workers did not wish to uh, deliver directly to uh, patients' residences. And so a Korean medicine doctor delivered uh, herbal medicines on the way to work. Also, Korean medicine uh, college student volunteers delivered herbal medicine directly daily to the door of uh, patients and would send uh, text messages uh, announcing that uh, the delivery had been made and in response, uh, many patients replied uh, how they were satisfied and uh, were thankful for the um, treatments uh, provided. And we believe that this led to uh, higher satisfaction rates. As mentioned earlier, uh, the Daegu Center was expanded and re reorganized and uh, relocated to the Seoul Center. And an average 14 to 26 uh, Korean medicine doctors and uh, Korean medicine college student volunteers filled the spots that were needed. And uh, this was um, the strength in, uh, with how we uh, could uh, conclude uh, treatment and uh, provide treatment to a total 20% of all uh, confirmed pa patients within Korea. Our Korean medicine college students uh, played a huge role in the center. Uh, they conducted the pre-examinations and they also delivered the herbal medicines. And as the herbal medicines were changed uh, generally on a three-day basis, uh, this was a very important role. To my knowledge, uh, within the program, we also have uh, various speakers uh, from overseas, such as the United States, and the Telemedicine Korean Medicine Center also conducted and provided treatment to overseas patients. These photos show various members of the National Assembly who visited and regarding the political issues, uh, Korea operates a dual medical system and so there is various conflict also in uh, Korean medicine and conventional medicine regarding COVID-19 and uh, participation in treatment. However, the implications of uh, the operation of the center dictate how Korean medicine and Korean medicine doctors could participate and be used uh, for COVID-19 and also other pandemics. and. Uh, these results uh, show our efforts and various considerations. And we are hoping that uh, these efforts may lead to more specific accomplishments and uh, meaningful outcomes. This concludes the end of my uh, talk.
management of mild COVID-19 patient with telemedicine of Korean traditional medicine, a retrospective uh, observational case series. -입니다. Hello, my name is uh, Yi Bom Jun, and I am a professor affiliated with Kyung University. My talk will be on the results uh, regarding how uh, we used the herbal medicine uh, through telemedicine for COVID-19 and the results that we published as a retrospective observational case series. Regarding how we would analyze the data and synthesize it, uh, we were not well prepared uh, regarding uh, how the data was uh, collected in telemedicine. However, uh, in the next pandemic, uh, I think we will be able to be more uh, prepared regarding how to collect data more systematically in our next endeavors. This study was conducted as a retrospective observational case series, and my talk will be uh, regarding this. As of March 2020, uh, the first pandemic mass spread occurred in Korea in the Daegu region, and the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, operated uh, a system in Daegu, which was very effective. One of the things that the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, did very well was that they tiered and classified uh, patients and uh, also provided uh, treatment accordingly to these uh, classifications. This is considered uh, to be well controlled and managed by the Korean CDC, and the severity class were determined by public health center doctors who interviewed uh, patients over the phone. And the severity class was uh, defined as follows. Out of uh, suspected cases, uh, the cases that were confirmed to be asymptomatic or mild were segregated uh, to self-isolation uh, in their homes or at uh, community treatment centers. And uh, this was one of the reasons why uh, the Tegu uh, hospital community and uh, medical care uh, did not uh, self-destruct from overload. However, regarding asymptomatic and mild patients, uh, direct management guidelines or treatment was not provided. And so, uh, Korea Medicine uh, came up and established uh, guidance for mild and moderate uh, patients. And according to the gui guidance uh, given for mild and moderate patients, uh, various herbal uh, medicine prescriptions and uh, uh, disease uh, pattern, uh, different differentiation uh, was given. We took into consideration uh, various materials of reference and included in that was Tongpe uh, Beduktang, uh, which was recommended by the National Health Commission of the People's Republic of China. It is known as one of the most effective herbal medicines for treatment of COVID-19, and accordingly, uh, we also uh, gave it due consideration and guidance for uh, prescription dosage was established. And we conducted an observational study of patients who were prescribed Tongpe Peduktang uh, through telemedicine to observe uh, the results and outcomes. Regarding our patient population, uh, the COVID-19 patients who received treatment from February to April 2020, of which the number was uh, over 2,000, uh, we selected uh, patients who were administered Tongpe uh, Peduktang, and that left us with about uh, 800 uh, patients. And also regarding the inclusion criteria, uh, patients who were confirmed as mild or moderate uh, COVID-19 uh, cases, and those who had uh, received three or more uh, prescriptions of Tongpe Peduktang, and those who had been continuously managed and successfully um, transversed into the convalescent uh, recovery period were included. We follow up the patients to assess for sequelae, and uh, 22 patients total were lost to follow up. And so we were able to uh, conduct follow up uh, after six months and analyze uh, them in 27 patients. Regarding the characteristics of patients, uh, the ratio of females was much higher. This may be attributed perhaps to the fact that uh, the mass outbreak in Daegu occurred in the Shincheonji church. Regarding comorbidities, uh, hypertension uh, showed uh, quite a high prevalence. Uh, diabetes, cancer, and COPD uh, showed a lower prevalence uh, out of com comorbidities. 
And also regarding comorbidities uh, and uh, higher age, uh, these were risk factors for transition of COVID-19 into development of a more serious stage. However, perhaps because our patients were enrolled in the early phases, uh, their transition into uh, more severe cases and stages was low. Also regarding smoking, only uh, two were uh, current smokers, and so uh, various risk factors uh, for uh, transients into uh, severity were low. Regarding initial treatment, a high rate of 70% uh, of patients had received none, and this indicates that uh, mild patients were uh, not provided with appropriate treatments and uh, they had to resort to taking uh, cold medications instead. These were over-the-counter uh, cold medications and uh, uh, patients who were actually prescribed prescription medications such as uh, paretics and uh, antibiotics were very low. Almost none of these patients uh, received uh, radiologic uh, examinations or blood tests. However, there were some who had uh, gone actively to receive uh, chest x-rays and 22% had received uh, chest x-rays and had been uh, declared normal. So all of these patients can be considered to be mild patients. In this situation, uh, for patients with suspected uh, symptoms, they would receive uh, examination and then wait for the results at home. And if they were declared positive and there was uh, room to accommodate them at uh, facilities, uh, they would uh, move there or they, if there was not, they would stay home for uh, self-isolation. After receiving the phone results that uh, they had tested positive, uh, still many patients uh, stayed at home for self-isolation until they received uh, confirmation of negative results and were released from the isolation. And analysis of these patients were uh, stratified into uh, these two different groups of home and facility isolation. The duration that the patients uh, underwent uh, self-isolation uh, until receiving uh, confirmed negative uh, results and released from isolation was on average uh, 30 days. Currently, the criteria uh, for release from isolation uh, regarding negative results have been eased, but at the time, uh, patients were required to have received negative results uh, two times on PCR tests for release from isolation. On average, uh, 33 days were required uh, for uh, release from isolation. Regarding the duration of each stage in home and facility isolation, for home isolation patients, from self-isolation to symptom occurrence, uh, the mean was 1.2 days until confirmation on PCR test, 4.6 days, and from confirmation to change to re negative results and release from isolation, 18.4 days. In those uh, in uh, facility isolation, uh, from symptom occurrence to self-isolation self uh, on average took 1.5 days and after self-isolation a confirmation of uh, positive results on PCR 6.7 days and confirmation until uh, facility isolation 4.7 days and uh, from uh, facility isolation to change to negative results on PCR 28.9 days. This can be shown as a graph as follows. Regarding the duration, if uh, the study design had been planned prospectively, we would have been able to compare whether the duration changed according to a herbal medicine prescription. However, the current circumstances as an observational study did not allow for this. Regarding analysis of uh, patients prescribed a Tongpe Pe Tukdang, from confirmation of uh, positive results uh, to their calling the Korean Medicine Telecenter took an average of 19.4 days, during which treatment was not provided. Also, as mentioned earlier by a different speaker, it uh, took time for them uh, to acquire this information uh, of uh, Korean Medicine Telecenter uh, services through their acquaintances. And so, uh, through better publicization, uh, we hope that we can uh, hope to accelerate the duration uh, for these patients until they receive uh, negative results to be much faster. Also regarding the duration of a herbal medicine prescription and administration, uh, they took it an average of 15.8 days, after which uh, they would transgress to the recovery period and be prescribed a different herbal medication. 
And so it can be seen that these uh, patients were uh, provided uh, appropriate herbal medicine uh, in the active phase. The main side effects of Changpe Pedoktang uh, included palpitation, uh, sleepness disorders, and dizziness and diarrhea. And uh, this was probably uh, prescribed and attributed to the fact that Changpe Pedoktang includes Ma Huang. And so in these cases, Ma Huang was removed, and afterwards uh, we saw um, a resolvement of uh, the side effects with type 2 Changpe Pedoktang. In analysis of the breakdown of uh, the components of Changpe uh, Pedoktang, as we all know, it uh, consists of Main Kamsoktang and Sagan Mawangtang, Soshiotang, and Uryangsan. However, it is not able to cover all of the symptoms related to COVID 19, and so uh, there was need for use of concomitant uh, medications. For concomitant uh, medications, Sohamingtang uh, and Kwakyang Jongisan, and the following prescriptions were used. After use of Changpe Pedoktang, uh, herbal medicine in the convas convalescent recovery period was used as follows for management. In the convalescent recovery period, uh, prescriptions such as Gyeongokgu, Jaeum Bopetang, Ikki Bopetang, uh, Changpe uh, Gyeongokgu, and uh, Gongjindan were used. And you can see that the uh, main point in these prescriptions is that they were uh, tonifying and uh, nourishing uh, yin. This table uh, shows the main results uh, after treatment uh, compared with the early stages. In assessment of the severity of the main symptoms, uh, the symptoms are listed as follows. A sputum, a cough, sore throat, rhinorrhea, a chest discomfort, dry mouth, a lack of appetite, and headache and dizziness. These were the most uh, frequent symptoms. Regarding the severity, we collected the data based on a four-point scale, and we later converted it into VAS scales. And for sputum and cough, out of uh, a total of 100, uh, sputum and cough each showed uh, 13 and 15 points respectively. In change of symptoms after treatment with uh, Korean medicine, uh, most patients uh, showed improvement, as can be shown, as can be seen in this uh, table. For sputum, cough, sore throat, rhinorrhea, and uh, chest discomfort, uh, there was uh, nearly uh, near resolution of uh, symptoms, and uh, the results were statistically significant. And so this indicates uh, indirectly uh, the effectiveness of treatment. This figure shows uh, the long-term symptoms that remain uh, after six months, which were published in uh, JAMA. And this, the main symptoms uh, that were shown uh, were fatigue, dyspnea, uh, joint pain, chest pain, and cough. However, the JAMA data includes severe cases also, and so the patient population is different from uh, the patients who were included in our study. Although there has not been publication of uh, the results for long-term uh, follow-ups in only mild uh, cases, our patient population uh, pertains to uh, mild cases and so can be of reference. The long-term symptoms are listed include fatigue and ocular symptoms. So uh, patients complained of uh, eyes becoming red and dry easily. Also, sore throat symptoms, it, uh, they were included also in the acute phase symptoms and also in the long-term uh, symptoms. Also, uh, anosmia, which is dysfunctional sense of smell, was uh, reported, headache, uh, dizziness, rhinitis, cough, dyspnea, uh, dyspepsia, anorexia, uh, myalgia, and sputum. Dyspnea symptoms were mild, and uh, they did not leave much sequelae, but still in some patients, uh, there was a little bit of a long-term dyspnea. Also, sputum, uh, which was high in the early symptoms, uh, decreased uh, greatly in follow-up. And in conclusion, in discussion, uh, treatments for mild COVID-19 patients must be safe and have few side effects. As mentioned earlier, a lot of these uh, mild patients were not able to receive appropriate treatment and had to resort to over-the-counter uh, cold medications or uh, prescriptions for uh, anti-inflammatory agents. These treatments were not highly effective and uh, the treatments for mild COVID-19 patients uh, should be safe 
uh, easy to administer, uh, so easy intake, and be uh, made available at low costs, as high costs would hinder availability and accessibility. In this regard, Korea medicine treatment uh, could be considered uh, as they are, they are safe and are stable, and although the cost may differ by country, they are generally uh, cost effective, and so it could be considered uh, to be a candidate for treatment of mild COVID-19 patients. In this study, compared with other research, the rate of dyspnea was low uh, as uh, the patients that we saw were only mild patients. In cases of dyspnea, uh, they would be classified as high severity patients and be transferred or referred to hospital treatment, and so Korean medicine was uh, not readily available to these patients. The cough pattern was also different. In severe patients uh, who show a dry coughs, the lung region involved is mainly the interstitial area. However, for our patients, the cough was uh, generally accompanied by sputum. And this is because uh, in the initial uh, infection phase, it's mainly uh, inflammatory and confined to the nasal throat and us upper respiratory uh, tract. In mild patients in the acute phase, the symptoms did not go deeper into the lung region. Also, while stamina was not very prominent in the acute phase, it appeared prominently in the chronic phase, and this may be due to uh, overload of the immune system and uh, uh, lacking stamina. Secondary to attempts of the body to overcome COVID-19 are taking toll on the patient's body. Limitations of this study include the fact that it cannot be representative of all mild COVID-19 patients as the number of cases is small and is subject to selection bias. And although it was not designed as an RCT, it would still have been good to be have conducted as a case control study uh, for direct comparison of uh, use of a treatment. However, this was not possible. And as we used the telemedicine, uh, we were unable to collect uh, data, objective data, such as uh, blood test results, and we did not have uh, any objective indicator outcomes. Also, due to shortage of time points of uh, data collection, the study is not uh, able to uh, comprehensively uh, reflect the change of symptoms during the du duration of isolation. Still, collection of the data towards accumulation of big data uh, is meaningful, for, especially for clinical practice, as this can be used uh, pragmatically. So we should not differentiate between uh, high-quality and low-quality data, but all, uh, instead aim to collect all data uh, to be put towards use in uh, future clinical practice. Recommendations in other uh, papers include use of detailed case reports, registry research, and observational studies that uh, provide more detailed analysis. These types of studies are especially uh, warranted and required in the current stage. Further studies uh, need to be implemented in the future, uh, including RCT studies. Especially regarding uh, study design, uh, we could uh, devise uh, study design where concurrent use of Korean medicine with conventional medicine is compared with a single use of conventional medicine. Although this is not an RCT, as is seen in the image on the right, uh, there are international uh, registry researchers uh, which are uh, recruiting participant institutions uh, currently. And so, a collaboration with such institutions for accumulation and collection of global data would also be meaningful for future uh, clinical practice as an evidence base. Uh, this concludes uh, the end of my uh, talk, and thank you for your attention.
이런 현상에 대한 의견을 주실 것입니다. 발표 제목은 Mental Health in COVID-19 Era Use of Mind Body Medicine in the Telemedicine Center입니다. 소개를드리겠습니다 I will start with part one. As you already know, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on mental health is spreading and growing rapidly. First, the impact of the COVID-19 virus uh, on mental health started with China uh, and its uh, impact on medical staff, uh, confirmed COVID-19 patients and the general public was uh, established. These reports especially um, increased uh, starting with uh, March this year. As the COVID-19 virus spread from China to the world in the Americas, the United States and Brazil, in Europe, France and Italy, and Af even Africa uh, showed uh, reports of mental distress. The reports have been continually made regarding its impact on mental health, including insomnia, anxiety, depression, psychological trauma, distress. Although in Korea we do have reports uh, that have been established, unfortunately they have not been published yet, and so I would like to introduce some studies that have been, been made by our research teams. As described by the other presenters, characteristics of individuals uh, receiving telemedicine men mental health services was assessed. Unfortunately, a validated mental health assessment tool was not used. However, NRS was used to assess the eight symptoms that are listed on the lower right corner. The four symptoms of overstrain, fear, anxiety and insomnia were shown to have a mean of around or over five. Although the study is limited in that it do, did not use validated uh, mental health assessment tools and the scores before and after the COVID-19 pandemic cannot be uh, compared, even with the limited data that we have, we can determine and know that for the patients visiting our center and for the general public in Korea, the impact of COVID-19 on mental health is substantial. Along with the spread of the impact of COVID-19 on mental health globally, which populations are especially vulnerable to COVID-19 impact is of interest to us. First, the studies uh, were conducted on medical staff and COVID-19 patients, and further on I will be talking about this more, but however, I would first like to introduce a study of ours. This is our study on unpublished data, and uh, upon assessment of characteristics of COVID-19 patients with insomnia who receive Korean medicine telemedicine services, we retrieved the data that 10.5% uh, prevalence was uh, shown. Further, although not diagnosed with COVID-19, influence and impact in the general public and population has all also been uh, collectively and widely reported. An area uh, receiving more interest uh, relatively recently are studies in the mental health of uh, vulnerable groups which are also being published. This includes studies in ethnic minorities, older adults, children and adolescents, and women, and patients with the previous history of mental disorders and individuals of lower socioeconomic status have been shown to be more vulnerable. A recent systematic review has reviewed the psychological and mental impact in diverse populations and aggregated the data, especially regarding anxiety and depression, a prevalence of 25% to 30% has been reported. As seen in the figures on the left and the right, uh, the studies show very high heterogeneity. The reason for this high heterogeneity may be attributed to the difference in tools uh, for assessment of mental health. However, personally, I think that the influence of uh, socioeconomic and uh, cultural differences by nation is also attributable. I will be explaining this in more detail afterwards. Also regarding the second wave, especially centered around the U.S., the impact of COVID-19 related deaths is also receiving attention. 
In Korea, the impact on mental health of COVID-19 has been receiving uh, medical and social attention, and so newly coined words such as Corona Blue, Corona Red, and Corona Black have been newly coined. And also the new term of 심리 방역, disinfecting one's mind, has also been coined. Corona Blue, as you can uh, guess, refers to depressive symptoms, Corona Red uh, refers to anger, and Corona Black refers to hopelessness and emptiness and increased risk of suicide. I personally am interested in COVID-19 uh, Red and Black because I think these especially reflect the cultural and social aspects. For example, COVID-19 disinfection is not only governed by medical and um, and scientific uh, evidence. This is because uh, the social safety net has also to be considered. And in establishment of social safety nets, the judgment of politicians has to be involved. So if a politically differently uh, dispositioned politician were to be in power and set isolation rules and regulations that especially are not consistent with one's medical and scientific beliefs, these rules and regulations and judgments may lead to individuals' anger. Also, social isolation and quarantine restrains and restricts individuals' freedom of, uh, of confirmed COVID-19 patients may also lead to anger. Anger in Korea is especially uh, manifested in uh, non-expression of anger as Hwapyong in somatized uh, symptoms. And overseas, there are more reports of more active expressions of anger, such as aggression and violence. Corona Black refers to uh, the impact, especially in vulnerable groups, such as the disabled and uh, those with low social econo economic status, or heavily impact economically. Uh, this leads to Corona Black. So this reflects not only the mental and psychiatric aspects, but also the socio-economical aspects and uh, cultural aspects also. Another axis of the studies on the impact of uh, men on mental health is regarding what the direction of influence uh, on mental health is. Studies have been published on the results in patients uh, with direct uh, infection of uh, COVID-19, how their nervous and immune systems are affected and afterwards their mental health. Also, various stress factors that are related with COVID-19 may also have indirect influence. Next for the WH survey, which was recently published. Mental health services which have been provided for mental health disorder patients, especially for vulnerable groups, has been disrupted. Next for a recent uh, study, that is a large-scale retrospective cohort that was uh, reported in the U.S. reported a bidirectional association between COVID-19 and psychiatric disorders. So bidirectional associations uh, with COVID-19, confirmed COVID-19 patients with increased risk of psychiatric disorders developing afterwards and psychiatric disorder patients with increased risk of uh, being confirmed and diagnosed with COVID-19 was shown. In aggregation of the previous studies and lessons that we can learn is that mental health problems caused by COVID-19 are prevalent around the world. Second, COVID-19 may affect our mental health longitudinally and transversely. After the first and second waves, we may have to expect a third wave due to the prolonged impact and various factors may have indirect influences such as through uh, large-scale deaths and also uh, socio-economic uh, impact which lead to widespread influence on mental health. Various studies have been conducted in medical staff, COVID-19 confirmed patients, and the general po population. However, in the future, more studies should be conducted in vulnerable groups. Next, I will explain some cases, some vulnerable individuals that have been visiting our clinic. There was a female adolescent patient who, due to social distancing, uh, could not regularly attend special education school, and due to this agitation, insomnia worsened. We also had an elderly female uh, with a history of MDD who, due to uh, social distancing, regular visits to welfare centers were suspended and the depressed mood worsened. Also, a patient with dementia staying at a nursing home due to social distancing, visits by caregivers regularly were very limited, and so he was not able to conduct uh, the usual walks and, and could not receive emotional support, and so the BPSD symptoms uh, worsened. Also, in the case of an individual, a female individual with neurotism, 
After contact with a confirmed COVID-19 patient, she experienced extreme fear of an infection. And because of those worries, I showed somatization uh, symptoms. Next, uh, regarding economic impact, after being laid off work and with a low socioeconomic status, a patient came in with chief complaints of anxiety, headache, and insomnia. So I believe that we should uh, pay more attention to such uh, individuals of um, vulnerable status. There are reports of ne negative influence due to uh, economic aspects and also from excessive exposure to social media. As shown in the lower right-hand corner, social isolation and ve uh, various negative uh, results such as negative thoughts regarding um, the development of vaccines, becoming delayed and uh, worrying too much regarding these negative results may have a negative influence on mental health. We talked about how in the uh, U.S. cohort study, uh, the mental health and COVID-19 uh, seem to be linked bidirectionally. And going back to the WHO study, countries show discrepancy regarding in their capability to respond to COVID-19, especially regarding uh, mental health. Many mental health experts are worried about this matter and also uh, focusing on it. According to the WHO survey, low and middle income countries are especially unequipped to respond appropriately to COVID-19 mental health impact and so need the support of uh, global entities. Lastly, I will talk about the socio-economic and social-cultural factors. In journals such as Lancet and BMJ, uh, the discrepancy between science and pol politics and medicine has been reported. So mental health is not only influenced medically and psychiatrically, but also through various social cultural factors. In conclusion, the mental health issue in COVID-19 era is can be considered a global uh, public health priority. Going back to the WHO survey, it states, uh, giving specific figures, that spending 2% of national health budgets on mental health is not enough. According to press releases uh, publicized in Korea, uh, by 2019, uh, this percentage was 1.5%. Although investments and spendings are increasing, uh, still we have a long way to go. The WHO also stresses that investment of a budget on uh, depression and anxiety returns are very high regarding the benefits and so that budget should be increased. In this situation, uh, promising strategies include telemedicine. Telemedicine did not emerge uh, today. It has been around for a while, and uh, the major advantages of telemental uh, healthcare, including improved access, reduced costs, flexibility, potential for combined treatment with uh, various other uh, treatments, and interactive sessions between uh, clients and clinicians, has made it a promising strategy. And as telemedicine is being used, uh, from active and non-active choice uh, globally, evidence will be widely accumulated and I consider it to be especially uh, promising for public health and public mental health. The WHO survey reports how telemedicine and teletherapy is already being used in many countries for mental health issues and uh, lack of uh, resources. And recently, a panel of psychiatrics uh, from 15 different countries convened and settled on a telepsychiatry protocol. So, in my opinion, uh, telemedicine will be used in the future continuously and increasingly for COVID-19 mental impact. Another promising strategy is mind-body medicine. Mind-body medicine is patient-centered and they empower patients to actively engage in self-care of health and self-management of symptoms. They also are creative and also holds the strength of easy uh, combination with telemedicine and other uh, technologies and treatments and have received evaluations of being highly accessible and uh, cost effective. So in the WHO, it introduces uh, basic uh, psychosocial skills and in the annex, it includes progressive muscle re relaxation. The US CDC also introduces meditation as a healthy way to cope with stress. The telepsychiatry protocol developed by a panel of psychiatrists from uh, 15 different countries also includes mind-body medicine, uh, such as relaxation and mindfulness techniques as first-line treatment. In this situation, our telemedicine center also used mind-body medicine. 
The protocol used in our study is described in detail in the published study. Largely, eight different symptoms were assessed in pre-examinations and history taking. In mind-body uh, medicine, modalities were prescribed for each symptom uh, accordingly. However, I must state that in actual application, uh, although uh, we did uh, evaluations and prescriptions, the prescriptions were not made uh, individually, one-on-one. -on -one. The clients were provided general uh, manuals and uh, resources. And after receiving the message, they would select the mind, mind modi modality that would uh, best fit their symptoms. Also, a characteristic of mind-body modalities include that it has a transcendent uh, implications. What transcendent indication means is that, for example, a progressive uh, muscle relaxation is listed at the top here, and it looks like, like it has a one-to-one -one correlation with overstrain. However, progressive muscle relaxation may also be used for fear anxiety, depression, anger, and other uh, physical symptoms. This goes for other mind-body modalities also. So the table here does not show one-on-one -on -one, uh, correlations between symptoms and um, individual modalities, but more uh, modalities that could be considered as first line. And also increase exposure of the patient to various modalities, and so it could be considered to be a process of where the patient can uh, find the most appropriate uh, mind-body uh, modality for themselves. Basic modalities, uh, there are three of them, and simple breathing uh, refers to finding your original uh, rhythm to be more stable and comfortable. Next is mindful breathing where breathing and body sensations are observed and focused on, along with mental imaging training that makes the body feel more healthy and fresh. And walking meditation is the only uh, mobile type of meditation here, where the patient is instructed to walk in their living room or in the yard, uh, focusing on their uh, body sensations through which uh, they can feel comfortable and balanced. Feeling comfortable and balanced is the aim of treatment, and these three mo modalities are to be conducted uh, regularly. And the aim of treatment is to increase uh, mental health potential. Now I will talk about each individual modality. For progressive muscle relaxation, each of the individual uh, muscles are locally tensed and then relaxed with breathing. And for autogenic training, uh, it was developed by Dr. Schulz from Germany, and it is a type of self-hypnosis. Self it aims for relaxation uh, by focusing on how the lower abdomen or the hands are warm or heavy, and the forehead is cool. Breath counting meditation is conducted by uh, counting backwards starting with uh, 10 to 1 with each time you breathe in and out. It is used as a distraction method to dispel uh, overly worrying or anxiety. Sitting meditation is conducted uh, by sitting on the chair or on the floor. Body sensations, thoughts, and emotions are observed uh, non-judgmentally and uh, toleratingly, acceptingly. It is a type of training, and although it is uh, very hard for beginners to do, a non-judgmental attitude, an accepting attitude, uh, can be applied to not only me meditation, but also their daily lives. Loving and kindness meditation is increasing the love and kindness one feels for others and extending it to others and could be considered a social type of meditation. I personally think that this type of meditation is the most important uh, for social uh, meaning in the COVID-19 era. Eating meditation is also included. Eating meditation is a type of mindfulness meditation. It focuses on physical sensations and the fulfillment of, of eventually feeling satisfied. And mental imaging training is also included through the form of uh, imagining the energy generated uh, through this process is filling the body with health and nutrition and is a good type of meditation for those with a lowered enthusiasm or appetite. Body scan identifies the physical sensations in a non-judgmental and accepting manner. To the best of my knowledge, body, body scans were not devised for the purpose of uh, insomnia treatment. However, clinically induces it induces a deep relaxation effects, and it is used for insomnia treatment from experience. Lastly, the 15-minute meditation with Qi is a meditation type that is unique to Korea. After inducing a relaxation response, uh, the warm energy that has been uh, 
focused in the palms of the hands, is then the hands are then taken to uh, places of symptoms and pain. As the warm energy is interpreted as, as qi, and at the end of treatment, uh, the warm hands are then taken to the umbil umbilicus or the tanjan for mental imaging training of delivering the warm energy to your body. These mind-body modalities were not only delivered by text messages, but also uh, the YouTube channel of the Association of Korea Medicine. And uh, these modalities are easily accessible through YouTube by the general public and those interested. However, I do have some suggestions for improvement. We adopted NRS uh, for evaluation of eight different types of symptoms. However, NRS is not validated for mental health use. Therefore, other presenters were able to compare this, the results before and after treatment. However, we were not able to do so. As we do not have uh, results, for mental health before the COVID-19 era. Therefore, we should consider adopting a validated and simple form of mental health assessment that is easy to apply to smartphone applications and for telemedicine. My second suggestion uh, regards how our mind-body modality is generally of a single direction, such as in using a YouTube broadcast. As seen earlier, walking meditation was the only type of mobile meditation. However, we do have other uh, techniques that are mobile, such as Taegukwon, yoga, and Qigong, which are used commonly, and we should use bidirectional communication more, such as through use of programs such as Zoom and Google Meet, to provide a more uh, vital and active type of mind-body medicine modality. As a last suggestion, in the mental health area, consideration needs to be given to vulnerable groups. This can be mainly divided into two different aspects, firstly regarding the mind-body modalities and also regarding how we will approach these patients using technology as uh, those with impaired cognitive skills and the elderly are not able to access these technologies freely as there is a gap in digital accessibility and information that is very readily accessible to the young generations are not available to the old. So digital technology which is more uh, user-friendly in providing mind-body medicine is needed. Thank you for your kind attention. From now on, we will be conducting a panel session with the four speakers uh, representing Korea. First, I would like to give a special thanks to our four presenters. I will be first asking questions uh, individually to our speakers and then receiving their answers, and then ask questions collectively to the group and receive collective answers. If presenters also have any questions for each other, uh, that is also possible. We will now start with the panel session. My first question is for Professor Pom Jun Lee. The patients that received telemedicine at the Korea Medicine Center displayed various symptoms, and although um, most were treated with the generalized uh, prescription of Tongpe Pedoktang, they also showed fatigue and sequelae. Do you have any recommendations regarding what types of herbal medicines that the physicians that use herbal medicine could use globally, and how long should they use them? So we treated many patients and also observed the sukhala symptoms. However, we do not have one fit-for-all prescription that fits all symptoms. For each symptom, as you all already know, traditional medicine or Korean medicine individually assesses each patient. So each patient should be individually assessed. For example, in fatigue, although it could be due to a lowered immune system or stamina because of the infection, as Professor Chan Young Kwon explained earlier, it could also be a secondary symptom due to depression. Therefore, we need to take on a multifaceted approach and uh, prescribe individually according to individual symptoms. As I explained in my talk earlier, in our evaluation of symptoms, in severe cases after uh, infection, uh, the in interstitial area is where the lung is compromised. And so symptoms are different from bacterial uh, pneumonia. Symptoms of sputum were not accompanied, and the general symptoms that were seen were dry cough. Dry cough was very prevalent, and in Korean medicine, a dry cough uh, correlates to weakness of lung, 폐위증. 
So the symptoms seen in this uh, present uh, infection were generally dry eye, dry cough, and dyspnea. So many cases developed into what we commonly refer to as lack of yin in the lungs. And so it could be considered to be a key point to use a herbal medicine to treat these kind of symptoms and recover to health. Next, I have a question for Professor In Su Chang. You told us about how the Korean Telemedicine Center uh, generally managed and treated mild patients and patients in the recovery phase for management of sequelae. Due to explosive increase of patients, those who could not be accommodated uh, by medical care were selectively isolated. And the current situation in Korea also shows the number of patients is in the rise again. And there are also press releases regarding how treatment is currently being considered in the self-isolation state. In the current situation, how do you think that we should uh, conduct monitoring by phone and what types of uh, treatments should be provided to what type of meaning? First, I would like to state that the Korean Telemedicine Center uh, that was conducted in the first half of this year has significant meaning and also holds great potential for the future, although this was a first uh, effort for us. The greatest reason why this model holds significance is that the environmental situations are continuously changing and also the national situations differ by each country and continue to change. As each of the conditions for each nation uh, differ, I believe that this model will be a good fit for one of these nations. As mentioned earlier, 80% of cases that we treated were mild, and although the rates differ slightly by country, Primary care physicians take about about 30% of each country's uh, national uh, care system. We always see on television screening centers with uh, personnel treating patients wearing level D personal protective equipment. This type of treatment cannot accommodate all patients or cover the explosive increase. So in the end, we would have to resort to the type of model that we proposed using remote medicine treatment and using primary care physicians in care of patients. And I believe that use of more uh, Korean medicine doctors and Korean medicine uh, with close provision is the most appropriate model and answer to our needs. I believe that this would lead to a more synergistic effect through more detailed and close care. I would like to uh, give a question to Professor Chan Yong Kwon. In diseases requiring self-isolation, of course isolation is not required due to uh, mental health. However, the area of mental health in this area is receiving more attention. How much and to what extent do you expect that remote uh, medicine treatment will have effect in that using video conference systems? In the area of mental health treatment, telemedicine has been receiving attention since earlier. And so many studies have already been published. As a representative study, a study published in 2013 in the American Journal of Psychiatry reports how in a primary care situation, uh, in a population of depressive uh, patients, the patients were divided into two groups, with one group receiving face-to-face -face consultations and one group receiving telemedicine. The patients were followed up for 18 months, and interestingly, the group that received telemedicine showed better uh, treatment rates and remission rates. In the discussion, the authors attributed these results to how in telemedicine, active participation of the patient is available. And more recently, AHRQ, in 2019, uh, it publishes comparative effectiveness review series uh, regularly. In 2019, data was comprehensively collected regarding telemedicine use for various symptoms and various pathologies and diseases. These results also show that telemedicine is effective and comparable to face-to-face in-person consultation. However, one problem is that the service discrepancy is very large. What I mean by in referring to service here is Although it also refers to the contents of treatment, it also refers to the technology used. These results in the case of our center, the mental health resources that are provided at our center are somewhat re restricted. It cannot be considered to be an intensive mental health care. Therefore, I believe that our center needs to make more investments.
and we especially would need a specialized designated team of personnel that can provide intensive care. Even if the number of personnel is not that large and that team of uh, designated personnel could provide bidirectional uh, treatment to our patients for better outcomes in our patients. Next, I have a question for Director Ngyong Lee. I think you held a very pivotal role in operating the Telemedicine Korea Medicine Center at the Association of Korea Medicine, managing it and also collecting data and then sending the data to the professors to write a very high quality data study. Do you have any comments for us regarding what difficulties you faced in operating the Telemedicine Center and also in collecting data? Including the inherent limitations as a non-face-to-face -face consultation. The bulk of outcomes and data are collected and come from the hospitals. However, our situation could be likened to that of Korea medicine clinics, with Korea medicine doctors providing individual treatments. And to the aim of standardization, I provided a guide and based on this guide, we provided education and training. And then we also attempted to standardize the reports in recording symptoms so that the same records would be used in writing up medical reports. However, because the Korean medicine doctors had to continue seeing patients and uh, in calling the patients, some of these calls would last up to 30 minutes. So leaving detailed medical records was, was a challenge. There's also the issue of difference in treatment quality. So the lack of standardization is an inherent limitation that is seen in primary care clinic situations. And also regarding telemedicine in non-face-to-face -face consultations, there is the issue of quality. And we stress the importance of using devices in increasing the quality of telemedicine care and also in collecting data. So using not only audio devices, but also video devices where we can assess the patient situation more comprehensively and also use of various uh, evaluation tools such as testing devices and technology. However, the fact that we were only able to use audio in calls is a large limitation. So in summary, we could say that the stan standardization issue, the rate of medical record taking in assessment, a use of more use of various devices and the lack of utilization of various devices and technology were problematic. Today's news release also reports increase in the number of patients in Korea and how these patients cannot be accommodated medically due to their increase. And so it is being proposed that these patients that cannot be covered have no choice but to go into self-isolation. We still receive calls from at least one to two patients every day, and we are currently worrying that there may be a second break. The center was not operated to the objective of research, and so there were limitations in setting a good data collection system with regards for research. There is also the main and major limitation of not being able to reserve, receive governmental support. And so it would be preferable if we would be able to uh, collect higher quality data through a more systematic data setting. The next question is a collective question for everyone, so anyone uh, can answer. Currently, we do not have any treatments or vaccines, and so the only method that we can use is self-disinfection and uh, social distancing. So these methods all refer to uh, cutting off contact from the source. However, under the current medical system, what alternatives do we have? An intake of herbal medicine tonics and through studies that study the uh, mechanism of action regarding these tonics, it has been shown that activation of AGH, IGH and IgM are involved. What kind of role do you think that traditional uh, medicine could take in diagnosing and treating diseases and also uh, treating the fundamental reasons and reasons of disease and the symptoms and also in treating uh, patients with underlying diseases? I would like to be the first to answer. Regarding the virus, the virus is a novel type that we have never seen before. 
Regarding how it was introduced to our country and cutting off all contact and in development of the vaccine, there is a certain period of absence. I think it would be optimal that uh, we would, if we were able to use herbal medicine during this period of absence and this whole progression of events. However, it would be problematic if we used uh, herbal medicines empirically and not based on scientific confirmation. And this is not acceptable from the perspective of public health. At this point of time, I believe that we should do is accumulate more data through the various treatments that we provided. The COVID-19 virus enters the body through the ACE2 receptor. And although they are not studies conducted in Korea, there are many studies that have been conducted overseas uh, on bench science regarding how uh, this process was in inhibited with use of herbs. In this case, we, uh, we would be able to make various recommendations based on the research of various herbs. However, in this situation, we would have to prescribe uh, herbal medicine just based on pattern differentiation, and from the perspective of public health, this is not acceptable. Therefore, in this situation, it is imperative that we increase uh, the capacity for research. Regarding your question on how much effect uh, intake of tonics would have, of course, it is a very hard and difficult to evaluate uh, the amount of effect. Upon infection with the virus, of course, our defense system uh, by means of IgM and IgE activates. There is considerable individual difference in the immune system. So even in exposure to the same virus, some individuals uh, show mild symptoms while some show severe symptoms. And this difference is attributed to individual immune response differences. There will also be an individual difference in in the threshold uh, required for production of antibodies upon vaccine administration, in this type of situation, it is very difficult to quantify the results and outcomes. However, from a career medicine evaluation standpoint, there is definitely a higher correlation with individuals with deficiency syndrome. So as we were talking about earlier, immune boosting would occur and vaccination with the same vaccine may result in higher thresholds for antibody production. Even in equal exposure to the virus, if your immune defense is stronger, perhaps we can generate these kinds of personal differences through use of herbal medicine. We'll have to keep thinking about and contemplating how we're going to confirm and verify these results, but I'm sure there's sufficient potential for this. I'd like to add a little bit more in, uh, explanation to that as there may be viewers uh, from non-medical backgrounds also. Advertisements these days advertise a lot of food products that claim to enhance immunity. However, viruses hold a key to entering the body. Regardless of whether our body's immune system is strong or weak, they open our body with the key and enter. So the only possible way to prevent infection is, as mentioned earlier, personal disinfection and social distancing. But once the viruses enter our bodies, it's a matter of immunity and resistance of the individual. Also, the defense systems, including immunoglobulins that we talked about earlier, are involved. We don't have a large body of evidence as of yet, but we're in the process of amassing evidence. So wouldn't herbal medicine be able to contribute to enhancing such resistance to a certain degree? And then personal exercise, lifestyle management, care and management of underlying diseases, these are factors of importance. So I personally am very positive regarding the potential areas where can we, we can use medicine, herbal medicine, to enhance our immune system. I would also like to add a comment, although not my specialty area, from the perspective of, pre of preventative medicine, while non-contraction of the coronavirus is, of course, an important precaution and preventative means, I think it also is an important preventive strategy to prevent transition to severity after infection with the virus. According to previous epidemiological surveys, patients with cancer, diabetes, chronic lung, di lung disease, heart disease and kidney disease, these vulnerability of these in individuals is a focus of attention. Especially obesity is commonly treated using Korean medicine. So why do obese patients transition to severe cases when infected with the novel coronavirus? Its mechanisms are proposed to be due to greater fat amount in lung fat, resulting in poor lung function. 
also increase in overall uh, inflammatory cytokine levels. And there are few cytokines such as adiponectin that protect, protect lung tissue. These mechanisms are being presented. Even if it's not necessarily related to the COVID-19 coronavirus, these mechanisms have already been investigated previously in herbal medicine studies on obesity. As mentioned earlier, it can reduce adipogenesis or inc increase adiponectin levels or reduce the level of inflammation. There are many such studies. There are also such components as curcumin, berberin, and ginsenoside. If we could discover the underlying connection, we could perhaps conduct a retrospective analysis. For example, of obese patients in Korea, some of them will have received herbal medicine and others will have not, so we could investigate whether there is a difference in the percentage of confirmed coronavirus cases that become serious. Of course, we would need to prove this through further evidence, but I am optimistic with regards to herbal medicine playing a substantial role in that regard. Thank you, your answers were all very rich in content. Okay, then I'll give you the last question. It has been about a year since the first case occurrence of COVID-19. Each of the four presenters have created a guide for Korean medicine treatment of COVID-19, collected statistical data, and managed the telecenter. We also have respiratory disorder and psych neuropsychiatry specialty professors co collectively coming from uh, many different fields. Could you give us a recollection of thoughts regarding your experience with COVID-19, also your thoughts on what the future holds? What future prospects? And on a different note, the Association of Korean Medicine, which could be viewed as the civilian private sector, took on the responsibility of running the telemedicine center. The government is not actively uh, utilizing Korean medicine or traditional medicine. Do you have any suggestions or messages for the various related sectors? Or if you have any questions for each other, please ask them freely. We will go around the table. Shall we start with Director Ingyung Lee then, please? Yes, well, in a way, I started at the center. Even now, the telemedicine center operates, and we're working on the 2020 COVID-19 white paper. We're going to have a publication press release next week. So in the process, I felt like this year was spent mainly dealing with COVID-19 by the association and by myself. Looking back, there is a lot of regret and more to be desired. My largest regret is that compared to the SARS and MERS and swine flu situations, KMDs came forward to take on an active role in responding to the pandemic. We opened a telemedicine center, and other than that, we also put in a lot of effort to expand the involvement of KMDs in COVID-19, including disinfection, management of public health, and epidemiological investigations of confirmed cases. However, due to Korea's specific circumstances and various issues, this did not come into realization well. So my biggest regret is that the process depended mainly on personal sacrifice and service at the private sector level. It's political and something has to be done on a larger scale. We continue to monitor cases in China. When considering what role traditional medicine could play in COVID-19, which was the topic of our debate earlier, vaccines fall into the area of preventative medicine. Development of a cure or prevention of aggravation of symptoms and treatment of symptoms could be considered to be the medical therapeutic response. And there are roles that traditional medicine plays in each of these fields, especially regarding control of symptoms upon detection, treatment of coughs, fever, pain, and the antiviral effects of herbs or herbal medicine, and various immune system stimulation effects. The next area that we have been focusing on is the sequelae, to improve the physical strength of those who suffer from sequelae or in treating remaining symptoms. I consider this role to be the therapeutic role of traditional medicine, of which the verification process is underway in China. Also, in the current situation where we have lack of medical personnel, as KMDs are similarly trained and educated as physicians, their participation in public hygiene management and disinfection should be increased. 
The challenges that face us are not expected to resolve anytime soon, as no one expects COVID-19 to end with the end of this year. In fact, even without COVID, many predict that novel infectious diseases are something that mankind has to live with. I also do not expect COVID-19 to end with this year, and that it may come back in a different form, and for that, the medical community and the government should respond with preparatory provisions. Regarding the matter of how to utilize the Korean medicine community and Korean medicine better, I think consideration is required at a government level and among healthcare professionals going beyond the Korean medicine community. There, consideration of the therapeutic effects of Korean medicine would also be included. Also, the issues of use of Korean medicine doctors may be discussed more in depth. That is the end of my answer. Do you have any comments for us, Professor Bom Jun Lee? Perhaps I think like this because I am affiliated with the college. But if we are to become more involved in public health, we need to strengthen the body of evidence. Frankly speaking, we don't even have any level 3 labs where we could conduct direct research on the effects of herbal medicine on the virus. So in lack of basic investments and funding, we can't participate in public health just because we think we should. In this situation, Chongpei Beiduktang was also introduced from China. Our neighboring country, China, is investing in and revigorating Chinese medicine. And as we are a relatively small country of fewer inhabitants, it would be pre preferable if we could connect and link such efforts internationally and also invest in facilities that could support such international scientific interactions. We would require an evidence basis for us to contribute meaningfully to public health, and we need to come up with a long-term plan. Also, as antigens continue to mutate, in SARS, MERS, and COVID-19, we saw mutation with the continued spread of infection. And as the next infectious outbreak is definitely coming, we should prepare for it. Telemedicine will be re-operated then, and clinical duty schedules need to be planned more systematically, and we need to register the results in a registry so that the data can be shared globally. We need to build a well-organized system. Could I also ask for a comment from Professor Chan Young Guan too? Yes, I would like to give you my personal impression mainly. Although I already did treat mental health patients, only after the COVID pandemic occurred did I realize how many individuals are susceptible to mental health disorders. This led to a lot of self-reflection on my part also. I'm sure many of the general public and public are watching this video, so I would like to send the message that I hope you pay more attention and interest to the people around you vulnerable to mental health disorders. Also, personally, I'm working on a project to develop a smartphone application for psychiatric use. In working with the project and planning the application, I realize that I'm still young and a person of today, and the technologies that come so easily to me are not so to the elderly or the cognitively impaired. These technologies may be very difficult to access and be uncomfortable for these populations. So even in the technological area, we should be more mindful and supportive of vulnerable social populations who are unable to benefit from such technologies. Yes, I would like to thank our speakers for their presentations and great comments in the panel discussion. Also, for our viewers who are watching online, we will provide our email address in the subtitles. Then, if you give us your uh, questions and comments through the email, we will do our best to provide answers. We will employ the same method for our overseas session speakers. And although, unfortunately, we could not conduct a joint panel session due to the time differences, if we have any mutual questions, we will pass them on and receive the answers and contemplate the method through which to pass on and share the Q's and A's. Thank you all for joining us today in this informative discussion. Thank you.
Session two is about overseas. Traditional medicine exists in whole uh, world, like uh, East Asia, Europe, and the US. In today's conference, medical doctors in these countries who use traditional medicine, like uh, traditional Chinese medicine, Korean medicine, and Kampo, will tell you what they did on COVID-19 pandemic period. Now you will listen each country's health policy to this pandemic and how was their approach in limited situation. The order is Hong Kong, Japan, Taiwan, Greece, Germany, Austria, and America. The first is Hong Kong, Dr. Yibin Feng. Dr. Feng is currently the professor come acting director with the, the duties of research, teaching, clinical consultation, administration, and service at the School of Chinese Medicine, Li Ka Xing Faculty in Med of Medicine, the University of Hong Kong. At the same time, he is a principal scientist in Hong Kong University Shenzhen Research Institute. He is also a Hong Kong uh, registered Chinese medicine practitioner and a consultant uh, physician at the University of Hong Kong Shenzhen uh, hospital and Glen Eagles Hospital. He also serves as a visiting professor at several universities in the mainland China and overseas. He received his bachelor and master education in Chinese medicine mainland China. Dr. Feng completed his tra uh, PhD training in Western medicine and biomedical research in Japan. His teaching subjects are pharmacology and toxicology of Chinese medicine and internal Chinese medicine. His presentation title is Chinese Medicine Treatment and Prevention of COVID-19 in Hong Kong, the People's Republic of China. Good afternoon. Many thanks for Chairman's kind introduction. I also would like to take the opportunity to thank for the conference organizer and uh, Dr. Song for inviting me to this conference. My topic is prevention and treatment of Chinese medicine for COVID-19 in Hong Kong. There are two legal medical systems in Hong Kong, Western medicine and Chinese medicine. Because Hong Kong have to do the treatment in infection disease measure situation. So Chinese medicine is not allowed to use it in hospitals until now. So today, I will talk some Chinese medicine measures for COVID-19 in Hong Kong by its research, prevention, and rehabilitation. Here is the epidemiological study by WHO and China and Hong Kong. As you can see here, the different uh, area have a severe pandemic of COVID-19 until now. As of December 1, 2020, there have been more than 60 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and more than 1.4 million days. Korea also have uh, some severe situation. China and Hong Kong also now still in severe pandemic in Hong Kong. Here is a strategy 
in COVID-19, this model cover all aspects of COVID-19 research, including ethical consideration and the integration of social science, and also medical science, and but the lack of Chinese medicine or other traditional medicines. I'm from School of Chinese Medicine, the Uni University of Hong Kong. The University of Hong Kong has ranked number one knowledge helper in the world by its research paper citation. Some of potential therapeutic targets vaccine for COVID-19 worldwide was highlighted in here. The number of COVID-19 COVID related articles is increasing repeatedly. According to WHO report from last year, December to November this year, more than 100,000 papers have been published in various languages. The themes cover clinical manifestations, treatment operations, vaccines, virus structures, antiviral drugs and diagnostic methods. But science also published a paper to say low quality papers of COVID-19 are flooding. Researchers should not take advantage of the pandemic crisis to lose their moral mission. New research topics, I suggested the number one is COVID-19 and other diseases. Number two, COVID-19 and uh, traditional medicines. As you know, China has used traditional Chinese medicine at the beginning of the COVID-19. And now China have a good situation in control COVID-19. After Chinese medicine practice Government recommended three drugs and three prescription for national wide use. For some reported herbs and formulas, there are many basic research and clinical research. As you can see here, one group reported one paper for by use by systematic analysis of single chain of medicine and the possible active compounds and the chemical skeleton analysis. And another group groups also reported the some formulas used in clinical practice and uh, focused one formulas in clinical trial and demonstrated this formulas may effect it to shorten the COVID-19 causes in clinical settings and also can reduce symptoms of COVID-19 patients. After did a lot of basic research and clinical research in China, why we still need to do bench and clinical study for Chinese medicine again against COVID-19? 
he has some death ratio from different countries. It is roughly cal calculated by WHO data on December 1, 2020. As you can see here, the lowest of the country is Singapore, but the highest country is China. As you know, because China uses Chinese herbal medicines combined with the Western medicine to treatment of disease, is it is get quickly controlled in mainland China. But from this ratio, it's hardly to say Chinese medicine is works. So I think we can have several reasons to explain this. Number one, this ratio need to be elaborated by medical conditions, social conditions, age, sexual, other diseases, and psychological issues. And also, whether combination with traditional medicine treatment or not, for important issue to further evaluation. General issue need to be addressed, lifestyle, behavior, and traditional medicine prevention. So there are scientific and clinical evidence for traditional medicine prevention and treatment in COVID-19. But we need to further study about these issues. So in Hong Kong, some group have reported the total overview situation in mainland China to use Chinese herbal medicine and also get some clinical significant outcomes. And one group also reported the effective form formula, Qin Fei Pai Du decocation. They may have uh, pharmacological effects and uh, network pharmacology of the herbs, how to work on the COVID-19. And uh, also published the general papers to analysis all aspects for traditional medicine in COVID-19 by Chinese articles. In Hong Kong U, some groups, Professor Zhang groups also begin to clinical study with mainland China groups. Some drug discovery and mechanism of action in my group, in Dr. Chen's group and the Professor's group also and going. The one of uh, Hong Kong U groups first reported uh, some several herbs may work on ACE2 proteins. It is also one target of the SARS. So because in Hong Kong, now uh, the COVID-19 treatment in hospital is not allowed Chinese medicine paint to participate because it, it is uh, belong to infection disease. And now Hong Kong, no hospital and uh, infection disease for traditional Chinese medicines. So government uh, encourages Chinese medicine practitioners uh, participate in rehabilitation treatment or prevention treatment. So my group also applied for government uh, funding for prevention treatment. Now, 
several vaccines are in clinical trials, and some of them have used in acceptable population. Recently, messenger RNA vaccine created by Modern and uh, Biotech Visa also launched in market. Based on the research results of messenger RNA vaccine, uh, attracted by the world. So why we should do research on prevention of COVID-19 by traditional medicines? It is because the following reasons. Vaccine effect confirmed by some clinical trial, but we don't know long time effect of the vaccines. Number two, Harvard University also published a paper in Science saying COVID-19 may break outbreak rapidly according to mathematical models. And uh, some clinical study also show the you may have an uh, antibody after coronavirus infection, but it may disappear quickly, quickly. And uh, some reporter also reported that uh, COVID-19 may twice infection by some persons. Uh, and uh, SARS CoV 2 will become the top killer of the elderly or weak people with various disease for a long time. And the uh, overall medical expenditure of humanity will raise sharply and uh, life expectancy will decrease. So, how to protect? Uh, vulnerable and uh, susceptible peoples, it is a question. But for Chinese medicine, the diet, diet treatment and uh, herbal medicine intervention based on the series of body constitution of Chinese medicine and uh, combination of prescription of syndrome to improve COVID-19 susceptible body constitution and strengthen body defense are impossible. So we start a clinical trial and basic research for some Chinese herbal medicine for its prevention of COVID-19. As you know, there are three steps for model measure, modern measure of prevention for infection disease, including COVID-19. Number one is controlling transmission routes. Number two is cutting off pathogens. Number three is reducing susceptible population and strengthening body defenses. We will focus uh, on the late two, late two. According Lancet and other research studies, uh, medial susceptible population of COVID-19 is 49 years old. And uh, according to literature and Chinese medicine practice and the experience, we think some potential target for Chinese medicine treatment and prevention. For the prevention, we use the deficiency of qi and yin, and uh, using the formula yi ping feng san 
and uh, Liu Wei Di Huang formula. For treatment purposes, we mainly focus on the Huang Lian Jie to decocations. Here is the Yi Ping Feng formulas. Cover three single herbs, Huang Qi, Fang Feng, Bai Zhu. This formula have reported by various infection disease uh, in, by its prevention effects. Now it is used in more than 10 cities in mainland China for COVID-19 prevention. Liu Wei Di Huang decocation consisted Shu Di Huang, Xuan Zhao Ren, San Yao, Zhe Xie, Fu Lin, Mu Dan Pi. This Liu Wei Di Huang formula is is a classical prescription for liver and kidney in deficiency. So we will, we will combine these two formula for the following symptoms, tiredness and weakness, shortness of breath when moving. Fear of heat, five heart hot, self pre separation and night sweat, red tongue, green white, thin white or light peeling, weak and fast pulse. Some shared targets among Yi Ping Feng San, Yi Ping Feng formula and uh, Liu Wei Di Huang form decocation and uh, COVID-19, which mainly relate, regulate nf kappa B inflammatory related pathway have been analyzed and, uh, exp and uh, explained by Chinese medicine series and uh, modern research series. For clinical trial, we hope to use this combination for the following outcomes. Primary outcomes will be focused on change of fatigue symptoms. Second outcomes will be focused on change of bio, biochemical parameters. So here is our research design. The study is a random double blind clinical research. We will use fill out the some symptoms and figure uh, scale and uh, category the patients in different groups. Take blood test again, twice. And finally, we will analyze, analyze the data to see whether the combination of Chinese herbal formulas can improve COVID-19 related susceptible bodies and enhance the body defense. We also think some uh, uh, risk of specific TCM treatment. For some symptoms, we will stop the use of the formulas if we find some symptoms in here. Here is our schedules, um, about one year's project. Conclusion. As a conclusion, Chinese medicine is an intangible culture heritage of China, 
supporting the development of China's medicine with its experience and uh, multidisciplinary research or integrating it, it into the mainstream medical system may achieve promising progress for COVID-19 treatment and prevention. In the presentation, we briefly introduced the general COVID-19 pandemic and the Chinese medicine used in COVID-19 in mainland China and Hong Kong. We use Yi Ping Feng San and Liu Wei Di Huang formula as the sample to explore, explore its network pharmacology and RCT plans. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Second Japan, Dr. Kasima Masayuki. Dr. Masayuki is the Japanese Society of International Medicine Certified Physician and General International Medicine Specialist. He is also Japan Oriental Medical Society Chinese Medicine Specialist. Dr. Masayuki's presentation title is Interesting. It's the Campo Strategy to Make COVID-19 Just a Call. Nice to meet you, everyone. My, I'm uh, Dr. Masayuki Kasima. So, uh, firstly, I thank Naona uh, very much for my op um, opportunity of this lecture and uh, will express my graduated and start to my, I would like to start my presentation. The battle against the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 is a total war of humankind. The history of East Asian traditional medicine is the history of the first uh, fight against epidemics. And there is no doubt that there is a big point in how to deal with this disease in this medicine. This figure shows uh, uh, clinical cause of COVID-19. The uh, disease has a variety of symptoms, uh, but the cause is relatively uniform. 80% of patients have mild colds and uh, recover spontaneously if they do not get worse in about one week. 20% of patients exacerbated in seven to 10 days and develop symptoms of pneumonia, so-called fast drip. Approximately 5% uh, of patients become severe and uh, require the treatment in intensive care unit 10 to 40 days after onset. What you can see for, from this is uh, uh, for most people, COVID-19 is just cold. If it uh, can be ended with just a cold without a somehow aggravating in humankind can win this battle against COVID-19. In addition, the characteristics that the symptoms progress slowly and the symptoms remain for a long time in consider to characteristic of dampness pathogen. In Campo, early symptom are considered in, important in diagnosis type of infectious disease. COVID-19 does not have a strong chill and fuss, so it does not apply to cold damage. COVID-19 does not have strong sore throat or high fever from the beginning, so it does not apply to warm disorder. It is just cold. We need game changer of COVID-19 pandemic. Game changer should end COVID-19 with a mere call without aggravated it. Candidate drugs now used as mild cold drugs. The 
prescription have the history that were once developed for the severe endemic of dampness pathogen. For example, Hakonto group Jinsoin Kososan. Candidate drugs, especially future prescriptions. In Japan, extract preparations are frequently used, especially for acute disease. It is easy to obtain and use. So I would like to list candidates from these. Kakonto plus Shosaikoto um, the Saibokuto are uh, Japanese original combination prescriptions. Saikanto also is the most used only in Japan. The origin of Kakonto plus Shosaikoto is a Saikaz Gekito of Asada style. Kakonto plus Bavreli Radix, Bicar Scarf Cap, Pinel Pinal Tuba, Gibsons. This prescription was passed on the great camp master Sohak Asada's family. Some records show the prescription was highly effective for viral pneumonia in Spanish flu. In 2020 winter, acute upper respiratory tract infection, there is a big problem. That is a differentiation between COVID-19 and other viral diseases such as influenza is difficult from the symptom. This strategy is developed to bundle both COVID-19 and other upper respiratory tract infection. The prescription with a yellow shadow is expected pre prescription for COVID-19. In the second stage, Cyboxto mainly used. Use of campo prescriptions for at least seven days, including the first stage. According to Japanese definition, it is moderate when oxygen is administrated and CBR when the ventilator is attached. Based on Gokoto and Saikanto for moderate or severe case, if patient has chest pain, change Saikanto to so Saikoto 2 Saikanto result in the combination of Gokoto Saikanto Hange Kobokuto. If patients have abdominal symptom such as a diarrhea, uh, change Hange Kobokuto to Jinsoin result in Gokoto So Saikoto uh, plus Jinsoin. Use saffron together if there is a rapid decrease in oxygen or if there is sign of the blood stasis such as dark tan. Start is supply C that will be early phase. By the Hochu Ekito. 
in recovery period through the chi and blood deficiency, blood stasis, frame in heart and brain, Ninjin Yoeito to supplement the chi and blood, saffron to remove the blood stasis, Chikujo Untanto to remove the frown. Saffron, uh, so various effects can be ex expected from saffron. So saffron can uh, uh, exclude blood sources, cooling, blood fever, de detoxications. And uh, so saffron can treat it in separatis and uh, delirium caused by infectious disease from Compendium of Materia Medica. And uh, uh, recently, uh, <coughs> studies that show that sa saffron has an antidepressant effect. So, COVID 19 patients, uh, so uh, different, uh, separate from the so sociality, social distance. So many uh, patients are uh, so in the deficit status, so affected for saffron. Saffron is a good product in, from Japan. I would like to the, introduce some typical case. For first case, 50 year old female chief confirmed the fever close contact with COVID-19 patients. She was asymptomatic in the morning of the day of onset, negative in the first uh, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction test. One on the same day, uh, around 50 uh, O'clock, she became aware of fever and uh, subject to feeling of the heat and the feeling of the warmness in the heart uh, limbs. The next day, of uh, the day is the first visit to my hospital, day two. So she had a fever of uh, 38.5 degree uh, from the morning and the visit to our hospital. Uh, past Past his is uh, uh, nothing particular. Present illness: no cough, no runny nose, no nausea, discharge, no dyskinesia, mild thirst, appetite loss, no diarrhea, no nausea, no back pain, no sore throat, no sweating. Height is height was a uh, uh, fifty. Uh, 155 centimeter, weight was 65 kilogram, turn examination white cold. Laboratory test revealed that so almost all normal, uh, but it's a slightly high D dimer uh, that is a risk uh, factor uh, over COVID 19 is worsening. And uh, so CRP, CD active proteins, uh, slightly high, 1.08 milligram per deciliter. There was no airway symptoms such as a cough, but computed tomography shows a pneumonia. It's a typical viral pneumonia. This figure, uh, the clinical cause. After taking first stage campo prescription, her symptoms improved and she reactive protein improved. 
in the second PCR was positive and she was admitted to the another hospital and discontinued campo prescription. Her fever and inflammatory response worsened again. Pneumonia on the computer tomography is also exacerbated by discontinuations of campo prescription. This case was exacerbated by stop the campo, so it is considered that the case did not improve naturally and was improved by campo. This figure is a computed tomography shows uh, time course to the worsening in the uh, viral pneumonia. Second case, 53 year old female had chief complaints, fever and a cough. History of present illness, pharyngitis, and a cough appeared in the e evening three days before the visit. Heat of uh, 3.6 degree appears as a night from two days before the visit to the day before. There was a tear and the fever was 38. 0.9 degree. On the day of her visit, she visited a nearby doctor and was suspected of having pneumonia on the chest X-ray examination, and the and was urgently trans to transported to our hospital. The day after the visit. Diagnosis was COVID-19 by PCR, and uh, the Campo A was started on day two. After that, she was transferred to another hospital, but she was admitted to the, our hospital again due to exacerbation of symptoms on day six. Past history, she is. Uh, suffered a systematic lupus erythematodes, maintenance uh, prednisolone, uh, two milligram per day. First visit our hospital's laboratory tested shows lymphocytopenia, liver injury, and so uh, C-reactive protein, 8.12 uh, milligram per day, per decibel. First today's X-ray examination, chest uh, X-ray. Uh, so, Patsy, uh, shadow uh, right up a uh, uh, lung lobe and uh, uh, computed tomography uh, granulous opacity and uh, so atelectasis of, uh, of uh, bilateral rung this X-ray examination, second time uh, admit to my hospital. So X-ray examination, uh, bilaterally uh, filtrations of X-rays as a worsening, and as computer tomography, bilaterally uh, ground glass opacity. So uh, that's a uh, suspected as so severe viral pneumonia. 
this figure uh, her clinical costs small amount campo prescription could not suppress the aggra aggravation symptom and fever and CRP improves promptly with increased dose campo prescription campo B Predonizolone continue to be maintained two milligram. When treated contractory to strategy was performed on the way, so campo prescription, campo C and the campo D, fever and CRP wasn't and oxygenation also wasn't. When I return to the prescription according to the strategy again, campo E, the fever disappeared quickly. The inflammation reaction improved and the oxygenation also improved. It is used in some cases other than these cases and it has been used in combination with modern medical anti-inflammatory therapy and antiviral agent for severe ill patients. A list of composition of compo drugs used uh, dur during the course Campo A is a low dose, uh, Campo B is a high effective, and the Campo D and E is a, against the strategies component, but the uh, Campo, uh, Campo D is against the uh, strategy, but the Campo E and F the uh, so, so very good effect. So conclusion. Uh, Campo can have the effect of end ending. COVID-19 as a just a cold. Campo can also treat the affirmative of COVID-19. Scientific verification is required and the Japan Society of Ori Oriental Medicine is engaged in various activity such as observation study and randomized control trial studies. Thank you for attention. So do Taiwan, Dr. Xiong Yang Huang. Dr. Huang is the director and attending physician of the Department of Traditional Chinese Medicine, Changhua Christian Hospital, Taiwan. At the same time, he is the director of Chinese Medical Association of Acupuncture, Taiwan. And the director of Changhua Chinese Medical Association, Taiwan. Dr. Huang's presentation is about COVID-19 case report, COVID-19 treatment use traditional Chinese medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Song Yen Huang, the director of the Department of Traditional Chinese Medicine. Zhanghua Christian Hospital. Now, I start my presentation. The title is Traditional Chinese Medicine in the Treatment of COVID-19 in Taiwan, Case Series Report. In December uh, 2019, the outbreak of COVID-19 in Wuhan City, Hubei Province, China, spread rapidly to the world. And 
January twenty uh, fourth, the first first case appeared in Taiwan. A fifty year old woman walked in Wuhan, came back to Taiwan. She got fever, cough, and the shortness of breath. Later, she was confirmed a COVID nineteen patient. January twenty fifth. A 22-year-old woman came to department emergency at our hospital with her family. She suffered from cold, fever, short, sore throat, muscle soreness, and a sore arm. Also, she had a walk in Wuhan City train. She and her family were sent to active pressure isolation ward of our hospital rapidly. Then they will confirm COVID-19 patient. Between January to April, our hospital treat total 11 confirm COVID-19 patient. All of them were recovered and discharged. The next one discharged at uh, April 9th. This was a consultation form of our hospital. It was sent from department infection at the uh, January 50th. The director of department infection, Dr. Liu, sent the consultation form. January 13th afternoon, my cell phone received a consultation message. It was sent from department infection. I saw the message and checked the consultation system. It was her, the first confirmed COVID-19 patient at our hospital. I was so surprised. Then our hospital published a paper which mentioned about a local transmitted case of a SARS-CoV-2 infection in Taiwan in NEJL. It also was the first paper related to COVID-19 which was published in Taiwan. Let's see the best data of the group of patients combined with the PCN therapy. All the patients confirmed by SARS-CoV-2 are tPCR positive. Chest the CT scan found that the lung of five patients showed the ground grass opacity. According to WHO severity classification of COVID-19, the severity of the patient were classified mild 1, moderate 3, and severe 2. In the conventional treatment group, the patient received therapy including oral drug therapy like honey flu and so on. All drugs for symptom improvement and prevent the complication of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. The world also supplied all two therapy. But the patient combined with PCN therapy used no auto therapy during hospital period. And now let me introduce PCN treatment. The number of breaches was three times per week. It means that we visit the COVID-19 patient once per two or three days. The treatment was based on syndrome differentiation of every patient. Chinese medicine therapy, including decoction and the powder. The treating period was from January 50 to April 28. Patients were suggested they can return to visit the TCN OPD per week and take Chinese medicine continuously at least one month to increase the pulmonary function and prevent the pulmonary fibrosis. Chinese medicine therapy, uh, oral decoction and five patients, and uh, oral powder two patients, and uh, and uh, the the oral medication frequency is QID, and period from January thirteen to April twenty eighth. Four patients follow up per week at least one month in TCN OPD after discharge. These Chinese herbal medicines are commonly used to treat respiratory infection disease and poor digestive function. Also, some herbal medicine 
have the antiviral effect and the increase the immunity of human body. Education is in the visual, and uh, we order the prescription by syndrome deviation of every patient. And uh, this Chinese herbal drug is for the respiratory system, including Ma Huang, Qing Nen, Jie Geng, Quan Gua Long, Qian Hu, Qiang He, Zi Su Ye, Jiang Chan, Chan Dui, Qing Hao, Huang Qi, Mai Men Dong, Gen Huang Qi. And uh, this Chinese herbal drug is for are for gastrointestinal system, including Ho Ho, Chao Guo, Bai Dao Ko, Bin Lang, Chang Zhu, Sha Ren, Jiang Ban Xiang, Wang Ho Xiang, Ge Gen, Dang Shen, Bai Zhu, Shan Yang, Cai Hu, Sheng Jiang, Da Zhao, Ji Zi Gan Chao. And uh, the if the patient got a severe primary infection, and uh, I a dead like Yu Xing Chao and uh, Ting Li Zi. And uh, also the patient discharge. I want to prevent the, the cause of primary fibrosis. I will attack Tao Ren. And uh, also some Chinese herbal medicine is for complication like headache and the stubbornness. And uh, we use uh, Bai Zi and the Chuan Chong. Uh, discharge criteria, according to the CECC Taiwan, if COVID-19 patient want to discharge, the discharge criteria include two items. First, two samples are needed, including salt swab and the sputum in general. Secondary, three continuously such COVID-2 nucleic acid tests need to show negative and all the sick COVID-19 patients combined with PCN therapy in our hospital discharge smoothly. Now I introduce the PCN treating effect of the sick COVID-19 patient combined with PCN care in our hospital. This is the first COVID-19 patient of our hospital, a 52-year-old woman. Her O2 saturation had been down to 93% at the day 8 and the continuous lower to 95% for 5 days. She showed severe short of breathing and the deep cut breathing. Her attending physician had considered to send her to MICU for further care. After combining care with TCM, her symptoms was subside and improved. Her O2 situation returned to normal level. At first, the patient suffered from fever, cough, sore throat, muscle soreness, diarrhea, and so on. After TCN treatment, her fever was subside rapidly and all the symptoms was improved. Then she continuous SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid test were negative. She discharges smoothly on, uh, on February on February 19. The first chest CT scan of the patient is shown typical appearance in both lung of the COVID-19 patient. There were several DGO lesions appeared in her broad lung. It means that Ball of her lung got a severe infiltration, and uh, she showed severe respiratory tract symptoms like a short of breath, deep cut breath, and a low O2 saturation. After two weeks PCN treatment, the secondary chest CT scan showed that the lesion in her bone lung became small compared with the further chest CT scan. And then the third CT scan at the April 13th, almost two months, two months later, compared with February 15th, it showed that the lesion of her bone lung almost disappeared. Also, she showed no symptoms of primary fibrosis, like short of grief, dry cough, and fatigue when she returned to visit PCN OPD. 
The secondary case is a 15 year old man. She, he was an artist. He, he, the type of infection is local acquirement and uh, infected by family. He had a smoke history and the day in hospital is 33 day of Chinese medicine treatment in the 22. The patient also showed respiratory symptoms like cough, short, sore throat, spilled her muscle soreness, fatigue, diarrhea, and so on. At the TCN therapy, all the symptoms were subsided and improved continuously. Maybe he had a smoke history, he still got a slight cough. The further chest CT scan showed there were two lesions in his four lungs. There was a big lesion in his left low lung lobe. After combined TCN therapy, the secondary chest CT scan had a favorable protein compared with a favorable second. It showed the lesion in his low lobe of left lung became small. It means that the infection infiltration was improved. Because of the three continuous negatives of SARS CoV 2 nucleus test, he discharged on February 27th. At, uh, at, uh, at, March, at, at March 3rd, he suffered from a traffic accident. He was sent to the Department of Emergency of our hospital again. The emergent chest CT scan was performed to evaluate the injury in his chest. The image showed that the lesion was almost disappeared in low lobe of his left lung. The third, the third case is an 88 year old woman. She was infected by her family. The chest X ray showed show like this image. The severity classification of COVID-19 of the grandma was mild because of the SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid sampling had rapidly turned positive. TCN therapy was recommended for health. She got a slightly symptom of cough and a sputum and a frost and a all and the state of hospital. But the SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid sampling had a rapidly turned positive. She continued she consulted TCN therapy for help. At the TCN treatment, she got a three continuous negative of SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid test and the discharge on, on March 23rd. The fourth case is uh, a 57 years old man, he was infected by his family. The chest x ray showed like this image. He also got a rapidly positive of SARS CoV 2 nucleic acid testing and uh, consult TCN therapy for help. And uh, she and uh, he got a slightly symptom like cough, sore throat, and uh, less butane. But the SARS CoV 2 nucleic acid test still rapidly turned positive. He had stayed at our hospital for almost one month. It was too long, so he decided to consult TCN therapy for help. After combining with TCN therapy, he discharged on April 2nd. The chest CT scan confirmed. There are several small lesions in his right lung. And the case five was a, a 29 year old woman. She had worked in Manila, Philippines before she came back to Taiwan. The chest x ray showed like this image. The chest CT showed there are small lesions in her both lungs. She had a gotten fever, muscle soreness before she came back to Taiwan. 
and uh, she had uh, received treatment in Manila. When she came back to Taiwan, she showed symptoms of respiratory tract, like cough and uh, fever. The test of SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid showed positive. Then she was sent to our hospital for further care. She also showed some GI symptoms like loss of taste and smell, poor appetite, abdominal discomfort, and diarrhea. When she got the TCN therapy at the further, she feared the function of taste and the smell was recovered and the poor appetite was improved. She discharged smoothly on April 16. Cash six was a was a 21-year-old man. He had a study in UK. He got a nasal obstruction and a runny nose before he came back to Taiwan. When he came back to Taiwan, the SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR test confirmed that he was a COVID-19 patient. He was sent to our hospital for further care. Besides the symptoms of respiratory tract, he also got a loss of his test and the diarrhea. At the combined TCN therapy, the function of his test recovered rapidly and uh, he could eat more. His symptoms got improved continuously, but the, the test of SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid rapidly turned positive several times. Finally, he got a three continuous negative of SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid test and the discharge on April 28. The Chester CT scan showed the typical lesion of COVID-19 in his fourth lung, especially a large lesion in his right lung. After treat Treating the six COVID-19 patients, we got some experience of TCN therapy in the treatment of COVID-19. There are several advantages of TCN in the treatment of COVID-19. First, decrease the symptoms of COVID-19 related, like fever, cough, sputum, sore sore, muscle soreness, diarrhea, poor appetite, loss of taste and smell, hypoxemia, and so on. The second, stop the deterioration. Two cases suffer from severe infiltration of whole lung did, did not get a rose at the TCM treatment. Third, promote, promote SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid sampling to turn negative. Three cases suffered from SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid sampling has rapidly turned negative. Three continuous nucleic acid tests were negative at the combined with TCN therapy. And the fourth showed the length of hospital stay. And the five prevent the primary fibrosis. Four patients combined with TCN therapy show no symptoms of pulmonary fibrosis like shortness of breath, dry cough, and fatigue after return TCN OPT visit. Two patients show no pulmonary fibrosis confirmed by chest CT scan. I am glad to join the team to care COVID-19 patients in our hospital. Also, I very thank Dr. Li Yuling and Dr. Liu Zhongnong, the Director of the Infection Department. Both of them have the open mind to accept Chinese medicine joined to treat the COVID-19 patient in our hospital. We work together and did the best to treat this patient. Express traditional Chinese medicine department of hospital. There were several traditional Chinese medicine department of hospitals also joined the treatment of COVID-19 in Taiwan, like a three service journal hospital. They treated 11 cases. Veterans Journal Hospital Taizong, two cases. China Medical University Hospital Taizong, one case. And the Zhanghua Hospital, Ministry of Health and Welfare, one case.
and the director general Yi Chao Huang, Department of Chinese Medicine, MOHW, invite all the experts of Chinese medicine in Taiwan and uh, get a conference of uh, interim guidelines for the inclusion of Chinese medicine in the clinical treatment of COVID-19 conference. Um, um, math six, we hope the guideline could be included in the official guideline of clinical treatment of COVID-19 made by CECC, WOHW, MOHW, and also National Union of Chinese Medicine Ducks Association also had a press conference on Chinese medicine participation um, in COVID-19 treatment and the new life of Chinese medicine epidemic prevention. We want to inform people that Chinese medicine can help to treat COVID-19 in Taiwan. Oh, and the National Research Institute of Chinese Medicine, MOHW, designed a novel traditional Chinese medicine formula Taiwan Qingguan Yihao, MRICN 101, has been administrated to patients with COVID-19 in Taiwan since April, since April. And uh, the article was accepted and published on biomedicine and uh, pharmacotherapy. There are several highlights. One, a uh, herbal-based formula deliver positive clinical outcome on COVID-19 patients. The second, the formula inhibits SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis in antiviral and the inflammatory assay. Three, real-world evidence offer insight to inform drug development. And the fourth, better bench approach shortens the time required for finding effective therapy. And uh, this is my presentation. I hope that all the information I presented in these slides will help the people to prevent and anti COVID 19 in the world. Thank you very much. The fourth is Greece. Dr. Mitiades Karabis. Dr. Karabis is a board member of International Society of Oriental Medicine. Also, he is a member of the Society of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation since 1992. Now, he is the president of a Hellenic Medical Acupuncture Society since 2012. His subject is development in the field of pain, especially musculoskeletal pain control with acupuncture. He is the author of three acupuncture monographs co-authored of three chapters in three medical books and have written and uh, published four biomedical acupuncture textbooks. Dr. Karabis will present with the title of Monitoring and Management of Mild and Moderate COVID-19 Patients in Greece, Uncharted Waters. Dear colleagues and friends, I uh, welcome you from uh, Athens, Greece, uh, in this uh, very important conference. And uh, before I begin, I want to tell you that uh, it's a great honor, a privilege for me to speak in a uh, in very highly qualified uh, audience. And uh, today we are in lockdown again in Greece in this uh, period of time. Uh, it's a rainy day, so uh, it's a, a, a great opportunity for me to stay inside and to speak with you. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank uh, the organizers and uh, especially thanks uh, to Dr. Sarah Song Mideok and Dr. Choi. Uh, it was uh, very helpful, the, uh, their assistance and uh, our great moderators in this kind of conference. So I can begin with my presentation. You can see the title. Uh, only to clarify for you that uh, the word Uncharted Waters 
means unknown waters because uh, we are talking about something that is very strange for us, for our experience. So we have to, uh, to rethink medicine. We have to rethink our mission regarding uh, uh, patients, COVID-19 patients. And uh, I will begin uh, sharing with you uh, the speech content. So I will uh, give you some uh, epidemiological data uh, about Greece, the first and the second wave, and uh, uh, two innovations regarding the observation and uh, monitoring uh, patients at home. And also I will speak uh, two things uh, regarding the management of COVID-19 patients at home. I will give you two, three tips uh, regarding uh, acupuncture treatment and the mechanism of action at, and uh, to the end, the conclusions. So I will begin uh, with some epidemiological data. And uh, in these uh, diagrams, you can see very clearly the first and the second wave in Greece, where a population of 10 million people. So at the beginning, we are doing quite well at the beginning of March, 2020. And uh, Greece it, uh, had uh, no many patients, no many deaths. It was very, very light for us. You can see here and very flat uh, curve in the diagram. Uh, but now from uh, November and then uh, we have a, a, a very big number of uh, cases, new cases and uh, hospitalized people and the people in ICU. So our uh, health system is struggling. And uh, we, the, the doctors in the first line, they made a big effort to sustain the population. And uh, the first innovation for us, it was that uh, we can predict the next month uh, measuring the viral copies in uh, the pipelines of wastewater of uh, the city of Saloniki. And uh, this is a very brilliant uh, job from the Polytechnical University of Salonik. And we saw from uh, the October in the wastewaters of Saloniki, this you can see the pipelines of Saloniki. And here you can see the, the, the curve, the increase of the, of the uh, virus. And we saw that uh, we had the uh, 500% uh, increasing of virus concentration in uh, waste waters. So we understand that after uh, 20, 25 days or maybe a month, uh, we will have uh, an increasing uh, of uh, new cases of COVID-19. So it was a very, very good job done from our uh, uh, Polytechnica institutes. And uh, we have uh, also a second innovation for uh, monitoring COVID-19 patients at home. And uh, this came from, uh, uh, we usually use from UK, the news to a scale, a score, a national early working score in order to, to see and monitor the patients at home. And we can do that First of all, uh, looking at clinical picture of the patient and the symptoms. So uh, we have to create three diagrams. The first diagram has uh, the body temperature. We have uh, to measure two, three times per day and to put in the diagram in order to see uh, the, temperature, uh, the temperature of our patient. The second diagram is uh, to, to uh, look after oxygen saturation level twice a day and to put the numbers in a, a diagram also, and also to explain the patient how to do that. And uh, the respiratory rate, because we know that uh, if we have more than 25, 30 breaths per minute, this is a very strong indication that we have a severe illness. So uh, we have to explain to the patients to write down these three numbers in three separate diagrams in order to uh, can advise them uh, and to 
evaluate the situation. Uh, it's not uh, it's not easy, and uh, we have uh, it, it's uh, very difficult to to have blood tests in the home and uh, COVID-19 test rapid or PCR at home. But uh, if it's, this is possible, it will be a great opportunity. And uh, the, the, a very important task it is to advise the family and caregivers uh, how to comport with the patient and how to see uh, the, uh, how is the evaluation of the disease. And uh, taking all this data, we have uh, in our hands uh, three possibilities. Uh, first, we can give general recommendations about uh, rest and adequate sleep, adequate hydration to drink teas and waters and uh, soups, and uh, to be careful in nutrition um, because it's, uh, it, it will be possible uh, and probable that we'll take some medication. So we have to, 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 to carry on with that. And uh, we have advice for some supplements, vitamin C and D, and also some minerals. And the stress management is very important for our patients. And also, uh, we have uh, pharmacological treatment now, and uh, we have guidelines uh, how to, to, to care this patient at home. We begin uh, low with paracetamol and uh, acetylcysteine and uh, maybe oxygen if they need that. And uh, we can go on with three second line uh, medication regarding dexamethasone, aspirin to protect all coagulation and uh, uh, therapy with antibiotics, uh, especially azithromycin. And uh, all that uh, in order uh, to, to see uh, how to protect the patient not to go to hospitalization and to uh, because the the evaluation is very quick and the uh, COVID pneumonia starts uh, in uh, in a few hours so uh, we have to monitor the patients very carefully and the third line is acupuncture treatment and we have uh, two things uh, here uh, to select uh, acupoints according to symptoms or to select acupoints according to pathophysiology in what exact stage we are in our patients and we speak about that later and now we have a, a second innovation uh, here in Greece and we try to put that in the hospitals and in the um, our offices the name is Ergo and is a very advanced uh, breathing uh, 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 science. We can monitor 24-7 uh, wireless the respiratory uh, rate with a platform that measures every breath directly with live analytics, automated scoring and predictive alerts doctors treating patients in the hospitals or at home. And uh, now there are many hospitals as you see that uh, runs uh, clinical uh, trials in order to see uh, how useful is that in COVID patient uh, monitoring. So uh, what we have here is a, a very simple belt that patients uh, wear. And this is uh, a sensor that collects signals to the uh, cell phone and then send the signals to uh, our console in the office or in the hospital so we can monitor the, the, every breath uh, he or she takes and then to advise uh, our patients in the monitoring center. So we can censor uh, and uh, write down and see uh, real time uh, the respiratory rate of our patient. So it, it, it was a, a, a very bright idea and uh, uh, we're now in, in, uh, in the States to see, especially in Italy, in some hospitals in Italy, to see how we can continue monitoring the, the 
uh, respirations of the patient's uh, respiration rate. And I will come to acupuncture treatment. That's, uh, I, I, I know that it's very, very known for you, but uh, I want uh, it good also for me to repeat all these things that acupuncture has a protective role because uh, we can act on non-specific immunity and specific immunity. And we know that uh, from data uh, with animal models and with uh, human researchers that acupuncture can maintain in uh, human homeostasis. So we can sustain non-specific immunity and protects the stress response system uh, in our hypothalamus. We know from animals that uh, acupuncture improves the number and the function of phagocytes, increase the number and activity of NK cells, natural killers, promote synthesis, secretion, and biological activities of cytokines, and adjust the content of serum complement. But also in specific immunity, the cellular part, we know that acupuncture promotes the proliferation of T cells improve the ratio CD4 to CD8, modulate the synthesis and secretion of cytokines, and increase velocity and effective of effectiveness of uh, immune response. And also regarding the humoral immunity, we know that acupuncture modulates the synthesis and secretion of various immunoglobulins and promote T helper lymphocyte secreting cytokines. Uh, so these are data that are consistent. We know they are published in very important uh, journals. And uh, in uh, my clinic, and according to my view, uh, I have some systemic acupoints for everyone at home, uh, or uh, patient, or asymptomatic, or healthy. Uh, so I have this pair of points that we can use in every patient because it has a very systemic effect, a very generalized effect, uh, no task specific. And also we have uh, the SUMU technique that we can, uh, we can uh, improve the function of uh, internal organs using the back shoe and the front MU point. So this diagram says everything we, we uh, want to know about the systemic effect of acupuncture. And uh, also, uh, we have a very, very important tool, the auricular acupuncture points. And we can use here also semi-permanent needles. So we put them there and we leave them there for about 10, 12, uh, 15 days. And uh, uh, we have a variety of acupuncture points in uh, the ear that we can use them according to symptoms. And uh, these are regions, are areas, no specific, specific points. So it's not important to be very precise in locating them. Uh, and I want to share with you that uh, we know that there are significant differences between different school different schools of auricular acupuncture regarding Chinese auricular acupuncture in Nozgies, auricular acupuncture uh, or Nibuaye or, or Bohr in Germany. So we have different location of points. It's not of, of big importance, all that. So this is uh, also for protection. These points are, are uh, also very useful to use them in healthy population. And now, if, if you are in a situation to, uh, to treat a COVID-19 patient at home, uh, you have first to think uh, according to symptoms or organs that are affected. So uh, with SUMU technique, you can, uh, we can assist the function of lung, of uh, gastrointestinal system and the heart. But also symptoms are very important. So we have to use acupuncture points for the fever, for the cough, for the dyspnea, the headache and the pains. And uh, we have for, from WFAS, 
uh, guidelines on acupuncture and moxibition. Uh, and we have two categories, some points and some techniques for the patients that are under observation and some points and techniques uh, according to syndrome differentiation. We have two groups for mild to severe COVID-19 and one group uh, with acupuncture points that we can use them in severe COVID-19 uh, patients and also pneumonia. So uh, I, uh, I read this paper very carefully from WHO and I uh, systematically put it down in this uh, one, um, uh, one uh, presentation in order to, to, to have them uh, very quickly and you can locate the acupuncture points. So uh, at least to tell you some things about the long COVID-19 patients in primary care, because it's more probable that you will see these patients in your office or in their homes, because long COVID is a low-grade, subacute or chronic post-viral inflammation. And uh, if we, uh, we want to define post-COVID is a long-term health effects associated with uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, so we have uh, long-term effects. We have after COVID, post-COVID. And uh, the post-acute COVID uh, are symptoms that are more than three weeks from the onset of the first pneumonia symptoms. And chronic COVID, uh, we call the syndrome that last more than 12 weeks. And we know that uh, 40 to 60% of the patients will develop long lasting symptoms. Uh, so after the emergency, and in UK now, we have uh, uh, 60,000 long COVID-19 cases, and they create for their rehabilitation about 14 pioneer clinics. Uh, for post-COVID or long COVID disease. And uh, the most common symptoms after the COVID is fatigue that lasts for months, shortness of breath, cough, joint pain, and chest pain. And we have some other symptoms as brain fog, depression, muscle pain, headaches, intermittent fever, palpitations, and tachycardia. So there are that are uh, very important uh, because the, the patient didn't feel well after the, the, the acute phase. And uh, we can have also inflammation and injury of major organs. I can remind you that uh, you have uh, uh, symptoms from the heart and uh, we, in, in the post-COVID control, we saw lasting damage to the heart muscle and increased risk of heart failure. And also in the lungs, we have long-standing damage to the alveoli. And in CT scans, we can see uh, scar tissue that uh, in, in the lungs that can lead to long-term breathing problems. Uh, the post-traumatic stress syndrome is present, so we have uh, patients that are depressed and uh, anxious uh, with uh, insomnia and uh, difficulty of, uh, uh, of uh, being active. Uh, kidney, renal failure and uh, problems in skin, rash or hair loss or urticaria. And also neurological uh, uh, long-term uh, problems as anosmia, insomnia, and brain fog. That means we have problems with memory, attention, and concentration. So these are very important points that you can meet them uh, weeks after the end of acute phase. And uh, in this patient, you can choose uh, also uh, main points, points according to symptoms, and points according to the organ dysfunction that is uh, present. And uh, 
I, I give you some ideas uh, what I use to these patients, especially auricular acupuncture is very helpful. Uh, the experience is not uh, evidence-based, it's only experience-based. So uh, no many patients uh, uh, come to us now uh, with uh, post-COVID uh, disease, but it's very useful to, to have them uh, as uh, uh, treatment. And I will give you some advice about this uh, patient. First, uh, you have to protect your patient and yourself uh, when you apply acupuncture. Uh, you have to insist in detailed history. And uh, here we have day-to-day -day clinical picture that can change. So we, uh, it, it's very important to, to evaluate and see the patients every day. Prefer a holistic approach. So at the beginning, uh, be careful to rest, sleep, hydration, food intake, herbs, vitamins, teas, mood, and, and uh, we will go in on uh, slowly. And uh, the advice is uh, start low and go slow with the treatments and with medications and also with acupuncture. Select the most important points for your patient. Know, know every point that you know, two, three points in the ears and uh, some points in the, in, the, in, the, in the body. And then uh, we can create a more com complete uh, program don't overtreat the patients. And uh, I don't mention the mechanism of actions, uh, only uh, that is very useful in order to communicate to the, uh, our colleagues in the hospitals uh, to have arguments about how all these things happen with acupuncture or with uh, traditional medicines. So, uh, this is a very, very easy example that electroacupuncture is a mechanical, electrical, and chemical stimulation in the periphery that releases endogenous opioid into inflamed tissues, uh, especially from lymphocytes, monocytes, macrophages, and granulocytes. And these peripheral acting opioids activate the receptors on peripheral nerves, you can see here, and inhibit cytokine production on peripheral tissue. So uh, the Peripheral opioids can protect you from inflammation and also promote analgesia. So this is a very important uh, mechanism, a very simple one with uh, systemic acupuncture points. Uh, we have this from animals and humans also. And this is a reference uh, that gives us uh, concrete evidence about the anti-inflammatory action of acupuncture regarding the regulation of TNF alpha, interleukin-6 and uh, interleukin-1 beta, beta uh, about three weeks after acupuncture. You can see here the difference uh, in uh, comparison with control group. So we know that this is true. We know that acupuncture can regulate the immune system, uh, but we have to convince also our colleagues. And uh, this is uh, the acupuncture and immunity at a glance. Uh, and uh, we have all these reports in order to convince uh, the medical staff and also the state uh, about the useful of our uh, treatments. And uh, I will end with some security concerns. Uh, we need evidence, uh, at least towards medical community and state authorities. Uh, uh, we have to address safety issues because uh, we, we saw dermatological consequences of COVID-19 and in this dermatological problems on periphery is contraindication of acupuncture. So the herbs and uh, is, is most useful that acupuncture. And uh, uh, also uh, it, it, it's very important not to have false impression of security uh, when we look at, at the patient at home because very quickly can deteriorate the situation and to lead to hospitalization and ICU. So we have to be very careful and to, to, to be in contact also with the doctors that are uh, in the front line in the hospitals. 
and uh, acupuncture at home have uh, increased risk of contamination also for us. And I have many concerns about quarantine rules, how we can, we can uh, uh, go home uh, because now we use telemedicine. So uh, it's safer, it's quicker, and we can do that. Uh, we can give advice, but no acupuncture. So acupuncture is useful for post-COVID uh, syndrome, but uh, no very useful for the COVID patients that are at home. And uh, at least the cost of personal protective equipment, the mask, the seals, the gloves, etc. Uh, we can change. Uh, we have to change them in in every patient we so see. So this is a a, a, a great cost uh, for you and your patient. And uh, I want to thank you here for your attention. And uh, I am waiting for your questions. Thank you very much for the invitation. The fifth is uh, Germany, Dr. Christian Tede. Dr. Tede is a general medicine doctor of Germany. He has practiced the TCM for 35 years in his own clinic. Dr. Tede is a lecturer in acupuncture and Chinese medicine at the International Society of Chinese Medicine and a longtime lecturer in Chinese medicine at the University of Witten Herdecke. He is co-author of, uh, of the book, Guide for Chinese Herbal Medicine Formulas. Nowadays, he has published articles on COVID-19. The first one is a three-stage treatment protocol for the treatment of the acute uh, COVID-19 disease with Chinese herbal formula, including uh, possible modifications based on, based on the Chinese governmental guideline for COVID-19 treatment, the seventh edition. The second is the treatment of post-infectious uh, post problems, especially of chronic fatigue syndromes. Dr. Thede's presentation title is COVID-19 in Germany, Situation and Perspectives of Public Health Efforts and the Chinese Medicine Treatment Possibilities. Hello everybody, this is Christian Theater speaking from Northern Germany. Thank you for your invitation, uh, Dr. Midyok Sung and uh, Dr. Moon Suk Choi, and greetings uh, to you as moderators and as well as to all the other speakers and uh, everybody who's watching and listening. Uh, please uh, let me start my presentation. I just uh, share the screen. I'm invited uh, to tell you about the situation of COVID-19 in Germany. Uh, the developments, public health efforts uh, made by the government uh, and the second part of our presentation will be about Chinese medicine and the treatment of COVID-19 in, in Germany. I will tell you something about the framework in, in Germany the associations uh, who are supporting Chinese medicine in Germany, as well as the possible degrees you can get here and the journals with uh, Chinese medicine content. I will tell you a little bit about uh, the sources and guidelines we used uh, to gain knowledge of the treatment of Chinese medicine and COVID-19 cases and uh, what we tried to do here. Uh, first, the developments in Germany. Um, little remark, uh, I have quite a bit uh, of pages and uh, I will go uh, through a thought rundown of some of the pages. If you want to know more about it, uh, you can look up the PDF file and that should be made available to you by now. We started in January 27th when the first documented uh, COVID-19 case or SARS-CoV-2 case in Germany was reported and uh, 
Actually, now we uh, have a little bit more than 1 million confirmed cases and sadly uh, more than 16,000 deaths uh, which are related to COVID-19. This diagram uh, shows you we had a peak of infection rates in early spring, that's uh, the left one, uh, had a, a, a comparable low rate of infections during summer with an increasing rate up to exponential increase in October. And uh, now we uh, have a kind of a steady state with about 20,000 to 22,000 uh, reported infections per day. And uh, slowly the uh, intensive care units and a couple of uh, clinics uh, are filling up. That's uh, to worry. The public health efforts uh, are mainly uh, instated by the Robert Koch Institute, so that is our governmental institution for infectious diseases. Until end of February, uh, there was declared a low risk, uh, but when uh, in March uh, we had our first uh, peak of infection rates, uh, there were contact restrictions, as well as a lockdown that meant schools were closed and all non-essential services, restaurants were closed, no more cultural events and so on. Since April, face mask wearing was declared mandatory partially. And um, uh, during the summer, we had a generous lightening of restrictions uh, with a hotspot strategy means restrictions uh, depending on number of cases and uh, depending uh, of uh, special regions where the cases increased. Since October now, uh, we have uh, again this uh, exponential increase of infection rates and uh, now we have a kind of a lockdown night light. Um, schools are open, but restaurants and uh, cultural events uh, are not allowed to open. That will be suspended a little bit temporarily uh, during Christmas days in New Year. And we have some special uh, issues in uh, Germany uh, compared to you in South Korea. I think uh, we had no pre-existing pandemic strategy. Uh, you could say we did not learn anything from uh, SARS uh, in 2003. Uh, in early spring, we had a lacking availability of face mask, for example, and other articles. Um, our contact tracing uh, is not as effective uh, as I think it is in South Korea, Japan, or in uh, some other regions in East Asia because of our legal limitations and because of public resistance. We have a Corona warning app, but the use is voluntarily and uh, it doesn't use uh, uh, personal data and uh, that limits is its effectiveness, I'm afraid. Uh, there's also uh, um, partial public resistance against wearing face masks, against social distancing and uh, mobility restrictions that makes things difficult. Uh, there are other issues uh, that uh, are possible, not uh, typical for Germany, but uh, are very common. Uh, suffering due to social isolation, 
uh, economic crisis and lockdown times. And uh, what's an issue on uh, public discussion is uh, restrictions of constitutional rights. And uh, we have uh, also developed, uh, we, not, not me, but some people have developed uh, conspiracy theories such as uh, Bill Gates has invented COVID-19 and uh, has distributed all over, all over the world and uh, is planning uh, to chip us all and something like that. And these people, uh, sometimes go together with political extremists, which is a social and political problem in Germany. And now uh, we have the prospect of uh, vaccinations and uh, people hope sometimes that uh, with the start of the new year, uh, Corona will just end with starting of uh, vaccinations. So uh, let's change the subject to Chinese medicine uh, and the treatment uh, of COVID-19. Um, you have to know that Chinese medicine is no official part of public health system in Germany. Uh, it's uh, privately organized. It's a private decision uh, for people to seek treatment with Chinese medicine. And uh, Chinese medicine practitioners uh, are medical doctors, also uh, Western uh, educated medical doctors uh, with a postdoc education, in addition to that, are the so called naturopaths uh, that are not medical doctors with a governmental license to treat people's illnesses. It's a bit limited, but you can. Uh, practice Chinese medicine with this degree. Um, there are some associations like my own association, uh, SMS, uh, you could uh, translate it as Association of uh, Chinese Medicine, um, which uh, offer an education in Chinese medicine as uh, education uh, and organized as part-time studies uh, over five to eight years and leads to our so-called certified physician of Chinese medicine. There are some master degrees um, possible in uh, Germany, uh, also exclusively part-time concepts. And we have one master degree, which is uh, independent German master degree granted by uh, the Technical University Munich in Bavaria. The other possible master degrees uh, are granted by uh, TCM uh, Universal University branches uh, from uh, Shanghai and Zhejiang. And uh, yeah, I personally um, am of the opinion that this degree uh, these degrees are uh, at least partially China dependent. We have some journals uh, where Chinese medicine content is published in. Uh, these are listed uh, here. Um, you can look them up later, perhaps in the PDF files. Uh, the sources which we use for our knowledge of treatment of Chinese medicine for coronavirus disease uh, is uh, this guidance for coronavirus disease, uh, which uh, as is my understanding you're well aware of and uh, call it just the seventh edition. I will do that also on the following pages. And um, other sources uh, I personally used uh, are listed on this uh, page. Uh, please look it up later. I won't go into the details because of the lack of time. Uh, this is a list of uh, observational and case studies um, reporting you know, the effectiveness of Chinese medicine concepts and the treatment of 
COVID-19. Um, I'm aware of uh, that uh, you have to look uh, a little bit carefully on the results of uh, those publications. Uh, but uh, all in all, it seems uh, that uh, usage of Chinese medicine versus COVID-19 in different stages is at least uh, worth a try. Uh, how did we develop our concepts in uh, Germany? Um, they're based on the seventh edition, of course, and uh, some of the additional sources that I mentioned. And uh, it's also based, uh, of course, of uh, pattern identification interpretation of uh, signs and symptoms according to the Chinese medicine theory. There's also been a pragmatic approach, uh, just like in China too. Uh, some people uh, offer um, patent medicines uh, for sale as pills. For example, this clearing pill with uh, Forsythia based on in Chao San. <coughs> And for later phases, um, the well-known Qingfei Paidutang, uh, I assume that you are well aware of this uh, formula, and uh, that uh, is um, mentioned in this page. Uh, again, uh, I won't go into the details, I think you know it, and it's uh, part of the uh, observational studies that uh, report uh, a degree of effect effectiveness of Chinese medicine in the treatment of COVID-19. Um, in my publications, I tried uh, an approach according to signs and symptoms uh, based uh, on what uh, most people think in China uh, to be the uh, major pathology of COVID-19. Uh, which is toxic epidemic dampness <clears throat> with the following developments. I won't go into the details on this page as well. Please look it up later. Um, what the result is no guideline. Uh, I wouldn't call it that because uh, TCM is not an official, official uh, part of uh, public health in Germany. I would call it recommendations. Uh, these recommendations are part of uh, some of the uh, publications in uh, Germany, uh, sadly only in uh, German language. Uh, I made some uh, translations if someone of you uh, wants to look it up. <clears throat> the core recommendations uh, are uh, restricted to certain stages. Uh, I would only tell about uh, the uh, pneumonia stages and uh, restricted to mild cases, uh, cases in mostly outpatient care situations up to moderate cases, maybe still an outpatient care situation or in, uh, hospitalized uh, patients. Uh, you will never see, uh, not at these times at least, uh, patients uh, in intensive care units in Germany who are treated with uh, any kind of uh, complementary medicine or traditional medicine, Chinese medicine also. That will simply not happen for some time in the future too, I think. Uh, so the treatment goal is not uh, to treat uh, very severe cases, but to avoid them. Um, my approach was uh, to offer three recommendations for uh, three main uh, clinical conditions, uh, which uh, I will, will list up shortly. One of it uh, is uh, accumulation of damp flame obstructing the lung, early stages of pneumonia without heat signs. And uh, please look up the special symptoms later. I think you are familiar with them. 
Um, the proposed formula for this condition uh, is uh, based on uh, three classical formulas, Hua Xiang, Zheng Xisan, Ma Hongtang, and Ting Liu Da Zhang Xie Fei Tang. You can over the list uh, in uh, later times uh, watching the uh, PDF files. Um, the concept was to create uh, three uh, basis formulas and uh, give some modification possibilities. The next proposed formula is uh, for a condition of damp heat affecting the lung. So not only dampness problems, but also heat signs and uh, the basic formula for this uh, I proposed is uh, based on Ma Xing Yigan Tang and San Ren Tang with additions and uh, also uh, some modifications given for this condition. And uh, the last commendation for uh, clinical cases for a little bit more severe and advanced clinical cases is uh, heat and toxic stagnation, stagnation blocking the lung. A formula given is based uh, on Ma Xing Shi Tang with additions. And uh, on this page, uh, you can look up to the uh, given and proposed modifications for this condition. Um, we have uh, some good experiences in Germany with this uh, concept. I uh, had some uh, telemedicine cases. I and uh, uh, I had some cases. Uh, other medical doctors treated uh, with my advice and. Uh, from the feedback, I got uh, all patients with uh, these uh, concepts uh, are well up to now. But uh, sadly, we have uh, no uh, um, observation studies ongoing in Germany. So um, after uh, acute stages of uh, COVID-19 or after infections and uh, uh, without any symptoms, acute symptoms uh, are the well-known problems uh, with uh, deficiency states uh, or persisting pathogens, pathogens. I won't go into these details uh, that uh, um, I think uh, quite common knowledge uh, how to treat uh, these conditions. Uh, I want uh, to um, throw a light on one special condition uh, I observed uh, more often in the last months that are signs and symptoms uh, were similar to chronic fatigue syndrome um, following infection with, with uh, Epstein virus. And um, often uh, the uh, clinical appearance uh, um, could, in my opinion, uh, be interpreted uh, as a Shaoyang disease and consequently uh, treated uh, with the different variations of Xiao Chaotang. And the results uh, are very promising so far. Uh, I observed uh, several cases of fast and complete recovery with uh, these um, modifications of Xiao Chai Tang. So that has been my short run up uh, of uh, COVID-19 in Germany in general and uh, possibilities of Chinese medicine, especially in Germany in the treatment. So let me thank you for the kind invitation again and thank you for your patience. Thank you for watching and listening. Goodbye, stay healthy. The sixth, Dr. Werner Baustetter. Dr. Baustetter is the founder of the Vienna School for Traditional Chinese Medicine in 1996. Also, she is the second chairwoman of the Center for Therapy Safety of Chinese Medicinal Therapy, Berlin. She has worked in her own clinic in 
Vienna since 1994. Dr. Baustadl's presentation title is The Impact of Phytotherapy and Traditional Chinese Medicine on COVID-19 in Austria and the missing support of health politics. Hello, I would like to welcome you to my presentation, COVID in Austria, numbers, facts, and figures. I want to talk about the role of the institutions and what was done, what is done, what isn't done. And I speak from the perspective of a TCM doctor, general practitioner in practice and the situation in Austria is comparable to many other countries of the European Union. To my person, I'm a DCM doctor. I've been a DCM doctor for 30 years and also teacher, and I'm founder and teacher of the Vienna School of TCM. So one can say I have a lot of practice. The Vienna School of TCM, there are a few facts. You can see we are not a very big institution. We are no university. And so there is some um, Difference is a different situation to many of you who come from big houses and universities. Our trainings, Chinese herbs, and a pretty new branch is Western herbs and TCM for medical doctors. So you use the valuable and unique TCM diagnostic system. And for treatment, you use Western herbs. So this has been done in Europe and the United States for probably 50 years. And in treating COVID, we mostly use Chinese herbs, of course, because there is a lot of knowledge. And we use at a smaller scale also Western herbs and with quite good success. Some basic facts about Austria. It is a small country in the middle of the European Union. And we have 40,000, 47,000 medical doctors. You can see the numbers. And complementary medicine doctors, 10,000 which means not only that 10,000 doctors practice complementary medicine of some kind, but they have diplomas of complementary medicine methods issued by the medical chambers in Austria. Practicing complementary methods, there are many more. We have 360 DCM doctors with diploma, 4,000 something acupuncture doctors and Western herbal medicine is a more recent thing. They got a diploma only a couple of years ago, so this is 93. More basic facts. You see the numbers, a lot of testing in Austria, lots of positive results. Many people recovered. About 3,000 died from COVID and we have 100,000, 113,000 active cases right now, which means they have some symptoms, maybe no symptoms, maybe more serious symptoms. You cannot really say. These are the official numbers in Austria. And these numbers pretty much 
match other EU countries. There are only three countries in the EU you have, who have higher numbers, especially more, a higher death rate, which is Italy, Belgium, and Spain. In order to tell you what happens in Austria, I use this concept of the three levels of society and the macro, meso, and micro level. The macro level is the society as a whole where they make laws, the politics. The meso level is groups, um, schools, hospitals, and the micro level is the individuals who do what they think is right for networks and so on. So the COVID activities on all these three levels, the macro level, political decision making, they exclusively, exclusively take Western medicine into account. There are four strategies, lockdown, distancing, testing as many people as possible, the exclusive use of Western medicine, and we know it's also problematic sometimes, and the vaccination. They wait for the vaccination, which is also questionable because we all know that these vaccinations are have been developed in a very, very short time. Herbal medicine, which is safe, which is not very expensive, has neither been recommended nor supported at all until now. In Austria, we have a regulation that only medical doctors are allowed to treat sick people, people with confirmed diseases, so accordingly, acupuncture and herbal medicine is legally performed by medical doctors who study Western medicine for four to what, six to seven years, and then start studying Chinese medicine and the training in Austria takes two to three years. So we can say, Politics only are in favor of the very ordinary four strategies we can see here. The meso level, the institutions, here we have the Austrian medical chamber, universities, hospitals, they all too are in favor of the four pillars we have just mentioned. And however, we have several DCM associations and schools, and we decided to engage in professional support. And for each other, and especially in times of COVID, there is also an alliance of these DCM institutions, and there are more other Asian in, uh, institutions of Asian healing arts, and it's called the Umbrella Organization of DCM and related Eastern health systems. So together we are able to set things in motion and move things forward, which is really a private initiative. And to sum it up again, the macro and the meso level they did never include DCM and any type, type of herbal medicine in prevention or treatment. The possibility was never even mentioned in the media, never, this idea was never officially brought to the people. The micro level, individuals and networks, we are DCM doctors, DCM practitioners of other disciplines, DCM pharmacies, very important, and also specialists of other countries, of other uh, specialties like sinology, pharmacology. 
and they can give advice in different areas and support different things. As I said before, we joined forces and we offered support to the Austrian health system. Our resources are, we have well-trained DCM doctors and practitioners. We have good quality Chinese herbs, good quality Western herbs, and we have experts who can give valuable advice. So that's the situation. And so we started to try to give government and the health systems information that there is more than just lockdown and hospital. Let me take a short side trip to the field of communication. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, Austria's public broadcasting system never even mentioned DCM, herbal therapy or other complementary medical methods. And we all know that the public broadcasting is very, very important, plays a central role in dealing with a pandemic, pandemic disease like COVID-19. And we have this group of experts, we gathered and forwarded information to the government. And I'll show you later how we did it and what happened. The first organized information campaign targeting many areas of the Austrian health system started exactly on February 25th this year. And I tell you right away, there was no response at all. The micro level, you can see it here on the presentation. There were a couple of people who tried to gather information from China, who was very quickly transmitted to Europe, to Austria. People translated from Chinese to English and German. And so we had a lot of information already in January 2020. In February, we started to try, we started to write letters and tried to phone and uh, make appointments to many officials of the health system. You can see a few information, a few institutions, you can see this information, who did what, and you can see what happened. The outcome was nothing. All our efforts to integrate TCM and herbal medicine as a possible support into the anti-pandemic measures did not succeed at all. So there was no response and we started to become, to become proactive. We created a platform named DCM Connect and what did it, what was possible to do? There was an online search for possible DCM therapy for people who wanted to know, to get information or people who wanted to get treatment. There is an online advice for free. There is a database who suggests DCM therapists and doctors, so mostly doctors, of course, in Austria, who has a, have a lot of um, experience also with COVID. And you can book a first consultation and treatment. This is the flyer we gave to pharmacies, to other doctors, to labs, to different institutions, and so made the TCM Connect platform well known. 
So what can DCM Connect do? We have 30 doctors. We've treated more than 100 patients by now. The number is increasing. We have approximately 80 clicks a week, and we do provide information for patients and people who want to get uh, information, people who are worried, everyone, basically. We support doctors in practice. We do regular online meetings so we can learn together, discuss serious cases. We exchange clinical observations. And this is also a possibility of a coordinated collection of data about prevention and herbal treatment. So we do collect data, but it's not as easy because we all work decentralized. We work in our own offices and there is no real coordinating place. And everyone works for free. There is no funding from government, as you can imagine. So what happened? Our own experience. We got all this information from China. We carefully read it. We use the prescriptions from China. And now we have a lot of experience on our own treating COVID. And most of our patients were in phase one and two, very few in phase three because they mostly are in the hospital. But we had patients with pneumonia in quite severe circumstances who could stay at home or only were briefly in the hospital. We try to do our work at a low cost and also the prevention medicine that came from China. Uh, we try to give it to people at very, very good price. There was a um, prevention medicine donated from China. One of our chief herb importers got 30,000 dosages of prevention medicine and we distributed to people who needed it, low income people or people in the healthcare system. And with very good success because what happened, all the feedbacks were very positive. People were exposed to COVID and hardly anyone got it. And very often the people who are positive or people ill with COVID, they stay at home, they feel worried, they don't feel good. And so it's very, they're very happy to uh, be able to connect and get Chinese herbal treatment, which is, which really shows very, very good results. If someone is pretty seriously ill, we call or the, we connect with them almost every day for a certain time. And I have not seen anyone so far that did not get better, not, not always in a short time, within days or so, but within one or two weeks, they all got much better. Another outcome, what is important for us that we can really use the Chinese herbal medicine well? Very important is knowing the traditional Chinese medicine well, including the classics. Important is intervision and mentoring. You know, if there is someone pretty ill on the phone and you have a tongue picture, it's very good sometimes to talk to a colleague that's experienced and say, what would you do? And so you share your knowledge and very helpful for the patients too. We can, we can do scientific research, we can contribute uh, and we can use very well documented case studies. We are working on putting together a collection of well documented case studies in the moment. And we can do and we can uh, 
try to do more global networking, sharing experience and data. So this is all based on a private initiative and there is a lot of positive outcomes so far. The conclusion is the Austrian government, most other countries of the EU do not include DCM and herbal therapies. The information from China came very early and was very valuable. And so we learned a lot and we could treat people on a pretty good basis. The establishment of digital communication is very helpful for patients and doctors, but also, uh, of course, for the gain of scientific knowledge. In these demanding times, we really would need to be included in the healthcare system. And we know that we would be able to help many people on a larger scale. We would like to go into retirement homes, hospitals, and get the information out, what the herbs can do to help people with COVID. The seventh America, Dr. Song Yi Jin. Dr. Jin is the Vice President of American Association of Korean Medicine. She had been professor at Southern California University School of Oriental Medicine and Acupuncture in Los Angeles. 2003 to 2018. Her specialty is Ungi medicine and some acupuncture. She conducted Korean medicine doctors in America to join Korean Telemedicine Center. Dr. Jin will present with the title of Progress of pre phone Consultation for COVID-19 in United States, America. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sing Hee Jin. Before starting, thank you for inviting me to speak in this big event, and I really appreciate Dr. Song and Bo San Jin to give me a great opportunity to inform you about progress of USA COVID-19 phone consultation center. Introduce myself. I got PhD degree at Pyongyang University. I'm a doctor of Korean medicine. And also, I got licensed by California Acupuncture Board. I'm a vice president of American Association of Korean Medicine and also USA COVID-19 phone consultation TF team leader. I'm a practitioner at Acupuncture Clinic at Orange County. That's my own clinic. I was practicing in Seoul, Korea since 1994. I moved to USA 2002. I have practiced in USA since 2002. This is all about me. Let's start. Look at the chart. I will inform you all about this content. First of all, we will look at COVID-19 status in the United States. Second, I will explain how to set up US phone consultation center and how to run it through successfully. And at the last, I will mention about the potential of herbal medicine and acupuncture in the future USA. Look at this line graph. This is the seven days average cases number graph. Next graph is the daily confirmed cases graph. We can see both graphs look similar. There are two waves and unfinished peak. This peak will make a big wave. It's November 29th. Total confirmed cases was 13,603,369. Daily confirmed cases was uh, 137,830. Do you account for 4% of the global population? And 19% of, uh, of COVID-19 deaths. California is the biggest state in USA population. It is 10% of the USA population. Now confirmed cases also are 10% of the total confirmed cases. So if you can look at USA, then just the search for California, it is a good sample. 
Next the graphs are for fatality. If you look at US COVID-19 death over time graph, you can find on April peak was the highest. It means we were not ready to COVID-19. And next the fatality rate graph at April fatality rate was close to 6%, now it's around 2%. It can be said that treatment prevention and disinfected hobby for COVID-19 has improved. This is COVID-19 confirmed cases per 100,000. Last seven days of November, it just stays small as a number in order. In USA, this number is indicated of guideline for school and travel. In Korea, can be think about the number. Biggest number stated date is New Dakota. New York, which was the most dangerous in April, now is around 36. California can see this graph. It is about 49. Total USA average case is 48.7 per 100,000. This is the city's guideline for school and travel due to cases per 100,000. Now hospitalized is getting serious now. Hospital, hospitalized and confirmed cases graph are similar. But good thing is in length of a hospital stay in days chart, in April was over 10, uh, 10 days, now 4.6 days. Recent with, uh, recent with uh, two, within two weeks, IC unit is US at 89% capacity, in California, a 75% capacity. It will be forecasted twice or triple in before Christmas. And then also, this 75% capacity is compared with uh, the after Halloween, end of October, is to triple. The, the case is counted to triple. Do you know how many minutes a day is? 1,440 minutes is a day, and now the average number of deaths in the United States on seven days is 1,549, more than one per minute. You know how serious it is. Nevertheless, Americans seem to believe with the idea that it's not my business, or it is nothing to do with me. Currently, the city of LA is set, to, uh, city of LA is said to be a confirmed case with one out of 135 people. That stays already a few days ago. Every day the number increasing is so rapid. First graph is a seven day average of a positive rate of a total case count. Positive rate is around 10%. But recently, South Dakota, Iowa, in these states, more than 50% confirmed cases of total test count. In confirmed cases, race and S, uh, ethnicity. The second graph, you can get some idea. The last graph, and, uh, uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can see it's for cases by state. Top five states are California, Texas, Florida, Illinois, and New York. Consider all this situation, we set up COVID-19 phone consultation TF team. Right after lockdown in March, we watched the news about breaking down hospitalized we got ordered to close all clinic except essential, not allowed to face-to-face -face practice in the whole country. So looked for our volunteer service as members of American Association of Korean Medicine, and they got incorporated phone consultation manual, herbal supplements, and lots of advice from ACOM. We really appreciate ACOM's help. Our TF team organization reasons are two centers. One is in New Jersey in the uh, East Coast, and then the other is Orange County in the West Coast. Now, they are our proud volunteers. 
There are 16 doctors of Korean medicine and six non-physicians, including the programmer, educator, phone consultants, over supplements, delivers, uh, schedule manager, and a daily notes writer. Phone consultants are their state licensed of acupuncture or Asian medicine. Volunteers who don't have a license help to other work except phone consultation. Telephone must telehealth must obtain consent form uh, consent for personal information by computer in advance. The insurance code for telehealth is newly prescribed, and that the telehealth you can advise on the pain relief, exercise therapy, massage therapy, food that is help for medical disease, and get reimbursed to the insurance company for the treatment fee. The United States applies a medical law according to the laws of the state in which doctors reside. On the other hand, Canada cannot col uh, collect patient information by phone except for several states, such as Nova Scotia, which is a state in which medical law cooperation with the United States has been established. So Canada was excluded from our service as it was not illegal. And it was not legal. And uh, the next Chinese ephedra, the research of regulation, it was investigated of the Chinese ephedra could not be used legally except for California and New York. So East Coast Center mainly used the Changpei Beiduk Tang tube without ephedra. We all studied about COVID-19 immune coronavirus management guideline, COVID-19 treatment protocol, clinical research of COVID-19 through Western medicine and Asian medicine, and then also ACONS phone consultation guidebook. After that, we got trained phone consultation system. This is a USA phone consultation flu chart. We are carrying suspicious group, self-quarantine group, and a recovery group. Phone consultation divided large two fields. Before phone consultation, we call pre-call and phone consultation. Pre-call is made through AAKM website, our website, COVID-19 events. If people couldn't access to online, volunteer help them. Phone consultation has three steps, initial, follow-up, and final call. After consultation, volunteer doctors build out the phone service program. Many a follow-up call was made when the uh, urban medicine was prescribed. Final call is a case in which a negative test is received through a retest or when no symptoms have been observed for more than three days without taking any medication. This is a full consultation program. It's the sample I, kept, I yeah, captured some uh, of our uh, program. Programmer made the patient information the government to format through Google Sheets, and the reservation system was run by connecting Google Calendar to the program. We collected the symptoms during the consultation and I put it in the program. These are three steps of phone consultation program. Um, initial call, follow, follow up, call, and a final call chart report. After put the symptoms in the program, as you can see, the data is automatically saved to the Google Sheet. The advertising, a newspaper, radio broadcasts, local news, social media, and the volunteers' own cleaning websites were used for advertisement. These photos were captured in the media of COVID-19 for consultation in USA. The support were included everything that would make the consultation work well. Included the program scheduling, communication with the volunteers, delivery, herbal stories, 
paperwork sentences. Now, this is a health supplementary guide um, guide paper for our the U.S. people. Now, this is a progress for phone consultation. Due to our data sheets, progress period was since April 9th to August 30th. About gender ratio, male was 42%, female 58%. Every age was 52 years old. Most age group was 50s and second group was 60s. Cons consulting period average 15 days, range 2 days to 36 days. Race distribution, uh, Asian 90%, Caucasian 6%, Hispanic 3.7%. Herbal medicine prescription period Anna, uh, is the total range is three to fourteen days, and uh, the Changpei Beduktang one with uh, ephedra every five point five days, and uh, Changpei Beduktang two without ephedra every four point two days. Satisfied of phone consultation center was the very satisfaction from consulted people. The following was mentioned in the satisfaction survey. Number one is expert consultant. Next was all services free, support over supplements, close care, and speed delivery. This chart is COVID-19 timeline. Even, even those who received the consultation at our center began to develop symptoms such as a fever within two to four days after being exposed to COVID-19. After the onset of the symptom, they had a test because they sus suspected COVID-19 and the time of the test was within three to four days after the onset of symptoms. The recovery period was different due to age and immune system. It lasted less than a week in healthy people, and it lasted more than a month, a month in over 50s. Look at the symptoms of confirmed people who got phone consultation at our center. This post shows the progress of common COVID-19 symptoms. And this is our digital our data common symptoms. Fever and body ache was appeared the first one to three days. Cough, hard to breathe, fatigue, lost appetite, lost smell and taste appeared with one week, within one week. After fever, most people got dehydration symptoms. During recovery, almost the symptoms was gone, but lose the taste and smell didn't get back. These two symptoms were not easy to get back to normal. Some of the recovery group complaints they held us also. And they used the herbal medicine. And that, uh, we use herbal medicine and initial and the treatment is step and tongue paper to count one and two and with ephedra with ephedra and then tongue myung and then the recovery step and then the kwakyong jonggi san and samso um. We don't have the diverse herbal medicine so it was diagnosed by the herbal medicine. So it's kind of, yeah, and coffee and uh, the heart to breathe, we can use the tongue to the tongue, and the fever, the body ache, and lose the smell, it, uh, the lose the smell and lose the taste without coughing and the heart to breathe symptoms. And then we can use in tongue meal. And then after recovery is that, uh, steps, and uh, the diarrhea or some um, the lost the appetite and Increase some not the digestion system, and then we can use and quack and some also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And then, uh, the, I introduced the Changmyeon that I mentioned one of the herbs supplementary. And you can uh, look at the, those, uh, the research paper and about the Changmyeon. And we, uh, we recommend the hydration care with the HOMA made oral hydration fluid to all confirmed group and suspicious group. And this is a homemade uh, oral hydration fluid. And you can just make it like this. And it's a protect the hydration and, in, and the, the care finish and the hydration symptoms also. I want to talk about the potential of urban medicine in the United States. Search, of, search on YouTube about uh, traditional Chinese medicine and COVID-19. It's over 175,000 views within six to nine months. And a general lower back pain and acupuncture got 190,000 views during nine years. Though uh, through comparing with both, Due to COVID-19, people's expectation and interest about acupuncture and herbal medicine have increased very uh, quickly. At clinic, the demand for acupuncture and herbal medicine is increasing. The demand feels anxious, stress, internal problem, weight loss, increasing immune system, hormone imbalance, infertility, women's disease, ear ringing, vertigo, allergy treatment, and extra. Before used to treat, uh, treat pain control arthritis, recently it's increased weight loss compared with that. These days, demand feels and diapers. US experts say TCM shows promise in the treating COVID-19. And uh, so uh, this video, Anna uh, introduced about US experts say that TCM shows promise and uh, the view are 172,000. This is video from CGTN America broadcast. Next. Uh, this is about New Yorker. We're interested with the traditional Chinese medicine to help avoid COVID-19. This American man who studied traditional Chinese medicine by himself introduced how TCM treatments, acupuncture, herbs, and Qigong work, and a brief history about TCM. These views are 25,000 for eight months or so. He's a famous YouTuber in medical field and has 39.2 thousand subscribers. We can see TCM traditional medicine is getting popular in the US and in the world. Can you imagine the acupuncturist of Antwerp in Belgium, a small city in Europe, memorizing the Korean Saam acupuncture? I lectured them in this spring. They wanted to know how to diagnose and use it. And then now I introduced one of my patients who exposed COVID-19 and was taken care of our program. This review is his own writing about his COVID-19 experiments. With my 27 years old clinical experience and 18 years of experience in the US, I can say that the potential of urban medicine and traditional medicine's demand is getting higher. That's it for today's announcement. Once again, thank you to all the volunteers. Thank you. Now it's time for session two panel discussion. I must say special thank you to all speakers for this additional recording to compose panel discussion. We, as Korean TF team, had preview all presentations and decided to present the organization of TF team. Hope every country who wants to manage telemedicine center gets some idea from it. I will ask Dr. Song to present this. Dr. Song, would you do that now? Yes, I will. 
For the audience, Dr. Che and I discussed about presenting organization chart of COVID-19 TF team in ACOM. There is control bureau for planning, roll calls, advertising, and overall control. The chairman is Dr. Che here. We made up three parts with the telemedicine center, supporters, and academic and clinical committee. Telemedicine center is consisted with the medical doctors doing telemedicine and service team doing preliminary checkup, uh, herbal dispensary, and delivery. Supporters is consisted with managing team doing fundraising and money management and supporting team for data networking and medicine supply and demand control. Academic and clinical committee is consisted with three parts. The chairperson is me. First, clinical guidelines development team conducted by Dr. Chang here. Second, medical advisory group led by me. Third, data construction team conducted by Dr. Lee Eun-kyung here. This is the workflow of COVID-19 telemedicine center. We catch our call from patients and ask whether COVID-19 confirmed case. If no, quit. If yes, we get agreement on personal information sharing. If no, quit. If yes, we start medical consultation. If the patient doesn't need the medication, we do observation with telling them self-caring guide warning signs, and keeping in contact with telemedicine center. If the patient needs treatment, we prescribe herbal medicine with instructions, checking signs, and in-call services every one to three days. All of our medical practice has been recorded in EMR and diary record. Through this process, we've got demographic and clinical data and published these articles in various journals. And this process was still going on. In Korean session, Korean speakers treated these researches. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will do session two panel discussion with answers from all. For the audience, I'm letting you know that this overseas session has been recorded by each and composed in one. Here is an email address on the bottom. We will support replies from speakers on your questions also. Questions are, first, would you say some about your impression as a traditional medicine practitioner's experience on this COVID-19? Second, what do you think about post-COVID-19 and any opinion on necessity of global network to use traditional medicine for epidemic diseases. Greece. Audience uh, addressed uh, two questions for me. The first is uh, to give my impression regarding my personal experience on uh, this COVID-19. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, here in Greece, uh, uh, we didn't use the, uh, traditional medicine uh, herbs or acupuncture uh, uh, in this pandemic. I have seen my office only post-COVID patients and uh, I use acupuncture for immune protection uh, in healthy patients. Also, I use acupuncture for problems caused uh, by quarantine, like insomnia, uh, stress and anxiety, depression, and chronic musculoskeletal pains uh, regarding to, to because uh, to work at home means uh, poor uh, uh, work uh, hygiene. So we have many patients with uh, uh, cervical problems, with hand problems, um, and uh, we see that kind of patient in the office. That our uh, our office are open now, uh, despite quarantine. The second uh, question is to say my opinion about the necessity of a global network in order to use traditional medicine for epidemics. And uh, of course, uh, I uh, believe that a network of any kind is essential in dealing with uh, pandemic 
uh, either traditional medicine or Western medicine, it's uh, of uh, important value for our patient. And it is a challenge for all of us to create guidelines in order to help our patients. But uh, unfortunately, we are not post-COVID yet. Thank you for your attention. Hong Kong. Hello, everybody. It is very great. I can hear the different speakers' experience in traditional medicine for COVID-19. For this panel discussion, I would also share some of my experience or opinion for COVID-19 in Hong Kong. The question from Dr. Song. Number one, would you say some about your expression as a TM practitioner's experience on this COVID-19? As I said in my presentation, there are two legal medical systems, West medicine and Chinese medicine in Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and mainland China. However, Chinese medicine treatment for COVID-19 is not allowed in hospital because there is no Chinese medicine department of infection diseases or Chinese medicine hospital in Hong Kong. It is possible for exploring Chinese medicine prevention and uh, rehabilitation of COVID-19 in Hong Kong. So we began to do Chinese medicine prevention of COVID-19 susceptible population in Hong Kong and uh, ho hospital authority and uh, local Chinese medicine in Hong Kong also began to do Chinese medicine rehabilitation of COVID-19. For example, I also saw a COVID-19 rehabilitation patient with menopause dysregulation and the patient and the patient was treated by Chinese herbal medicine for one month and now recovery completely. I know some of the speakers have used the traditional medicine for COVID-19 in different countries. Anyway, we should think about legal issues for using Chinese herbal medicine or not in Hong Kong, while professional issues in Chinese medicine are not problem because there are lots of experts in Chinese medicine in Hong Kong. Some Chinese herbal formula for COVID-19 have been reported by scientists of mainland China and uh, have been registered in, registered in Hong Kong, such as Lianhua Qingwen Capsule and uh, He Xiang Zhen Qi San. So we may use registered Chinese medicine formula or create a new prescriptions for COVID-19 in coming years. The experts of Chinese medicine can, pro, can have TCM treatment protocol of COVID-19 for Chinese herbal medicine or acupuncture, according to Chinese medicine theories, holistic view and uh, syndrome based treatment. For number two question from Dr. Song, what do you think about post COVID-19 and any opinion on necessity of global network to use traditional medicine for epidemic, epidemic diseases? First, SARS-CoV-2 
may come again and uh, COVID-19 may repeat continually according to various authority reports from the various famous university. Second, vaccine can stimulate, stimulate body specific difference, but its long effect is not, is not known. And we can strengthen general body, general body def, defense by traditional medicine. Third, nowadays we still face a big challenge in COVID-19 and the new pandemic diseases. This needs drive us to explore new therapeutic strategy and new drug from traditional medicine. One of the advantages is Chinese medicine always has prescriptions for any existing diseases and new emerging diseases. Even, even though we don't know what pathology induces the diseases. In modern condition, what we have to do is to prove scientific and uh, clinical evidence for traditional use. And we can build up, build a global network to use traditional medicine for epidemic diseases and do more research for any other epidemic diseases treated by Chinese medicine. I think this conference have provided good relationship between us, among us, to build such network to use traditional medicine for epidemiological diseases and uh, collaboration among us. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Japan. Thank you for your question. Uh, my answer, uh, it is important to, to treat as darkness pathogen and to use half exterior, half interior target therapy from the beginning to end, to use gypsum for high fever and uh, to therapy for blood stasis and blood fever for severe people. people. And uh, it requires treatment for relatively long time, so that I think the effect is good. The sequelae of COVID-19 are C and blood, or C and E deficiency, in addition to blood stasis and from in heart system and lung system, which can be resolved by early treatment target them. Next question. Uh, answer my, my answer. I think it is necessary to establish a price for information rapid risk sharing. For example, a system for sharing information on specific symptoms and this was a pattern of traditional medicine. Thank you. Germany. Dear moderator, speakers and audience, I feel particularly honored to have been asked by Dr. Mijuk Song to answer some additional questions. I may have neglected to do so initially because it feels a bit strange for an ordinary general practitioner to talk about Asian medicine concepts to Asian people who are real academic professionals on the subject. I just don't want to seem presumptuous. So my impressions from the point of view of a TCM practitioner in Germany is uh, somewhat mixed. Sadly, complementary medicine concepts in general are somewhat neglected to the public, by the government too, and by media and press also. On the other side, they buy drugs like remdesivir for hundreds of millions, which we know is not really effective. And people seem to hope that we will all get our vaccinations just as after Christmas and then get rid of Corona. 
in contrast to that, my personal experience as a medical doctor in treating COVID-19 with Chinese medicine, as well as the reports from fellow doctors who consulted me for the treatment approaches, are very good. Every person I know of in this context as well and didn't need to go to a hospital. But please keep in mind, there's only personal experience and no systematic observation. When thinking about the question of what to do in post-COVID-19 era, the question comes to mind, when does that time really start? Besides the necessity of treating post-infectious chronic COVID-19 diseases, I'm reminded of chapter 36 of Dao De Jing, where I meant to learn that if there's something we wish to overcome, we have to accept that we will get strong first. And I'm personally afraid that we as humankind could have to live through this phase yet. But I'm convicted that we have to live through this together and have to put aside political differences and economical greed for once and for all, if you ask me. So yes, of course, we do need a network of practitioners of traditional medicine. Let's get to work. Thank you again and best wishes to all of you. Taiwan. Ladies and gentlemen, the afternoon is a time of Q&A. The first question, would you say some about your impress as a peer practitioner experience on this COVID-19? The two photo is I wear a solid trust at the time. Everything is the first time. When the outbreak of severe acute respiratory syndrome SARS threatened the world in 23rd, I was an auto doctor. I work in traditional Chinese medicine department at the China Medical University Hospital, Taichung. We need to wear masks, check body temperature, and the respiratory syndrome every day. The same situation and now. Facing SARS, I feel the terrible pandemic for the first time. I could do nothing for SARS patients at the time. But now I wear isolated clothes and uh, entering the active pressure isolated world to treat and uh, treat COVID-19 patients. I didn't feel any fear in my heart. I just thought that I need to use Chinese medicine to care for COVID-19 patients, especially they were no effective drugs or vaccine could use in these times. I am happy that I can follow Chinese medicine and care for COVID-19 patients. And this afternoon, I share the experience of Chinese medicine to treat COVID-19. I hope more and more patients suffer from COVID-19 could accept Chinese medicine treatment. The second question, what do you think about post-COVID-19 and any opinion on the necessity of global network to use PN for pandemic disease? According to the result of the normal traditional Chinese medicine formula, Taiwan Qingguan Yiha and on ICN 101 has been administrated to patients with COVID-19, which designed by National Research Institute of Chinese Medicine and of HW. I just say there are four key points. One, a herbal-based formula deliver positive critical outcome on COVID-19 patients. The second, the firm inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis in antiviral and uh, inflammatory assay. Three, real-world evidence overall insight to inform drug development. Four, back to bench approach shortness of time required for finding effective service. At the present, there is still no effective treatment for COVID-19 and the vaccine is still in the stage of evaluating its effectiveness. It's necessary to expand the use of traditional Chinese medicine to treat COVID-19 
and uh, to find effective compound to treat COVID-19. Thank you. USA. Above my opinion is a team practitioner's experience on this COVID-19. Traditional medicine is essentially the first to determine the nature of the disease, identify the cause of the symptoms, and come up with the treatment method. I think this basic treatment process can quickly access infectious diseases whose cause is unknown in Western medicine. In addition, research to prevent viruses such as Chongmyung is ongoing, and Chongmyung is actually effective in treating colds and flu. Also, this helped to do reduce COVID symptoms due to our data. Necessity of a global network to use traditional medicine for epidemic diseases. As we learned from the cause, uh, case of COVID-19, with the full support of Association of Korean Medicine, AAKM was able to quickly set up U.S. phone consultation center and was able to respond quickly based on Korea's experience. Also, this conference is a good example for global network, even if it's not an epidemic. I think that a global network is necessary. But in the pandemic situation, I may say it is absolutely necessary and that's something to consider. Austria. And there was a question, would you say some about your impression as a DCM practitioner's experience on this COVID-19? And as I said, my experience is very positive. Uh, we need experienced, well-trained doctors. We need structures so we can treat people effectively. And it would be very important to get access to people who are exposed to COVID in hospitals, in retirement homes, and so on. And the second question was, what do you think about post-COVID-19 and any opinion on necessity of global network to use DCM for epidemic diseases? It's happening already. I'm talking here for you at the conference in Korea. We got a lot of information from China. We um, share a lot of information within our community of DCM doctors and practitioners and so but it can always improve and I would say let's gather and exchange data and knowledge from east to west from north to south and let's establish good criteria for case studies and so let's go and drive and drive forward the research and the use of databases for the benefit of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you for your answers. As a moderator, it's a great challenge of traditional medicine on COVID-19. Traditional medicine usage is getting known to many people as an effective treatment on night and mild symptoms globally, and monitoring patients via many devices by medical doctors is important, but government support is very necessary in all countries, as we know only China does. From this conference, Korea is suggesting global traditional medicine network for epidemic disease to share information. I agree. We have to gather evidences and results from all of us. Especially, I was impressed with the cases of Japan. I guess the integrated medicine will be our future. There are many academic societies of traditional medicine in the world. Let's do this together. Now, we close this international online conference. Our release will be related for long with the Korean Medicine Online Promotion Center website. Thank you for all, and hope you stay healthy till this pandemic ended. Thank, Thank you. you.